Morning. The Prince George's County Planning Board is now in session. Um, there are a number of things that I have to say in my statement today, so please bear with me. First of all, um, this is going to be a combined planning board of the March 19th hearing that was canceled and the March 26th hearing. Um, we are endeavor endeavoring to proceed with the business of Prince George's County and the business of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and the Planning Board during these highly challenging and unprecedented times, resulting from the global outbreak of the noble um, the COVID-19. The Commission is, is committed to promoting a healthy environment for the public, for our Commission staff, for the applicants, for our citizens, while continuing to maintain and, and perform business operations. Thus, out of an abundance of caution, we are and adhering to the state's social distancing guidelines for gatherings of 10 individuals or less, the Planning Board will be meeting virtually until further notice, utilizing online, phone, and video capabilities. I would like to take a moment to express the new participation guidelines. All participants must have pre-registered in advance by noon on Wednesday yesterday. Um, all materials had to have been submitted by noon yesterday. Uh, all participants, please, please mute your phones when not speaking because we will have too much feedback. So I'm going to have to remind you periodically to please mute your phones periodically. I mean, unless you're speaking. Please do not put your phone on hold because then we will hear, you know, that music. Um, <clears throat> participants, participants connecting through a computer, laptop or desktop, tablet or smartphone can join the meeting via the link provided. Um, the public may continue to watch the planning board meeting streamed live uh, via, via http colon slash slash mncppc.iqm2.com. Videos of past meetings will be stored at that same web address. Um, again, I want to take this time to thank each of you. I want to thank our phenomenal staff. I want to thank the amazing citizens of Prince George's County. I want to thank the applicants. I want to thank our board. I want to thank everyone for working so hard to allow us to continue the business of the county while protecting everyone by um, creating these virtual hearings. So huge kudos to everyone and huge kudos to the public, to the applicants, to everyone for joining in our, this flexibility so that we can move and push forward the business of the county. These are exceptionally trying times and I cannot thank you enough for the flexibility and ingenuity that you all are displaying during this time. And before I proceed with the order of the cases, I must remind, because we care, I must remind each and every person who has signed in or who is watching as we are streamed, please, while we are taking, moving forward with the business of the county, Please take care of yourselves, take care of your families, practice social distancing, get enough rest, eat healthfully, just take care of yourself. Stay as positive as possible. This too will pass at some point, but we have to do our part and take care of ourselves as we go. Um, okay, so the planning board, um, before we do that, I, want to, I have a couple of other announcements. And I do want to take a moment of silence for some people. I'm not going to proceed with my typical announcements. Um, there are a number of people who have passed nationwide, a number of Hollywood folks and, and folks in the community um, um, in the nation who passed. I'm, we lift them all up. But in our commission family, we lost George Baxter, um, the father of Thomas Baxter, Baxter at the commission. Also, we lost William Bill Ely, who was the vice chair of this very planning board for many years, who was a stalwart in the community, and who was the first African American to serve on the Chevrolet Town Council. Uh, we also lost uh, Joan Rothgeb, the, uh, the wife of Paul Pinsky, Senator Paul Pinsky, the mother of Council Chair Todd Turner, the husband of Glenda Alexander who, in the county exec's office who was killed in a, a uh, tragic car accident, and uh, Francis Arnold uh, Jr., the father of Joy Russell, the chief of staff for the county executive. So if we could, and for any of you who have suffered losses during this time, 
our hearts go out to you. And it's especially painful because there's no way to go forward with the traditional service. So um, it's extra painful at this time. Please take a moment of silence um, as we remember each and every one of you and, each and, and the families of each and every person who passed. Thank you. So during this planning board session, we, as I said, we're combining the March 19th agenda with today's um, regularly scheduled March 26th agenda. So I want to inform each and every person what that order will be. So the 319 items will be heard first and they will proceed in this order. Detail site plan 19043 Royal Farms. Detail site plan 19023 South Lake. Detail site plan 19024 the South Lake Architectural Umbrella. DSP uh, 18037 uh, and the uh, departure from parking and loading standards 486 both for Clinton Veterinary Veterinary <laughs> Veterinary Hospital um, and uh, preliminary plan 4-19005 the fairways at Glendale Estates and then PGCPB no, number 2036-419005 for fairways if all goes well we aim to take a 30 minute break for lunch so that we can, so that everyone can take a break and that we can switch technical hearing writers for the next agenda. The next agenda will be the March 26th agenda and that will proceed in this order. The draft minutes of the February 27th meeting, the consent agenda, which is um, planning board resolution 2020-31 for Cantor Creek, specific design plan, and, and PGC, P PC 2020-30 for departure from sign design standards 696 Collingbrook at Rosenhauer. Then we will proceed with our companion cases, a detailed site plan and departure from parking and loading standards for easy storage, Capitol Heights. Then we will have the conceptual site plan um, 19009 for 5600 Agar Road and the detailed site plan 19053 for 5600 Agar Road. And that will complete our agenda. Again, Thank you very, very much for your patience. Please work with us. We hope we have no tech, um, technology glitches. Um, and again, please mute your phones as we proceed. The, my final uh, reminder is you should have received your census forms in the mail. Prince George's County is obviously going to lose a lot of money, as is the nation, as is the world during this time. It is all the more imperative that you complete your census forms and send them in ASAP. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is counted and we lose $18,250 for each person not counted. In 2010, that resulted in a loss of $363 million. During this, um, these challenging times, we cannot afford to leave that kind of money on the table. So please, please, please complete your census form. Thank you very much. I am now going to proceed with our agenda. Um, my first order of business is um, the Royal Farms. It's a detailed site plan 19043 Royal Farms number 356. Before I call on Mr. Bush, I'm going to tell you who I have signed up to speak and then verify that uh, you all are there. I have Mr. Bush as the staff reviewer, the staff supervisor Jill Kozak, um, Council Matt Tedesco, our transportation staff Glenn Burton, um, the speakers um, Jeff Bainbridge, applicant, and Jennifer Leonard from Dewberry. Um, I also have a, additional exhibits uh, for this case. They are the applicant's proposed amended conditions and a letter of support from James Herring. Um, I'm assuming that that's everyone. I have no way of confirming that, so I'm assuming that's everyone, that everyone's signed on. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Bush. I think you might want to do a roll call. Oh, how do you do? Okay, so can I do a roll call? Let me go back to those names. Mr. Before, Mr. Bush, can I confirm? Um, Mr. Bush, you're on, right? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Ms. Kozak? Ms. Kozak? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Mr. Tedesco? Good morning. I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Burton? Yes, I'm here. Mr. Bainbridge? I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Leonard? I'm 
here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Bush, you're on. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good morning. For the record, I am Donald Bush, with the Urban Design Section. Again, everyone else, please mute. For you is a detailed site plan for DSP 19043 for the construction of a 4,649 square foot food beverage store and gas station, which was previously scheduled as item 5 of the March 19th planning board agenda. Before starting, staff would like to point out an additional item submitted by the applicant. Noted applicant exhibit one, proposed revisions to staff recommended conditions. These items were received prior to 12 noon yesterday, and they were entered into the record and published online for viewing by the public, and will be discussed further in this presentation. Next slide, please. The site is in planning area 72, Council District 5. Next slide, please. Subject property is shown here in red. Royal Farms is located in the southeast quadrant on the intersection of Parkway, Cardmore Road, and Finsey Drive. Next slide, please. The subject property is bounded to the north by the public right of way of Parkway, Cardmore Road with industrial uses in the light industrial I-1 zone beyond. To the east, by Parkwood Place, the I-1 zone property developed with industrial uses beyond, and to the south, by industrially used properties in the I-1 zone, and to the west, by Finsey Drive, with property in the I-1 zone, owned by Wamada, Washington, Metro Area Transportation Agency, Authority Beyond. Next slide, please. The site is situated southeast of the 20th and approved New Carrollton Transit District Development Plan, as shown in the hashing to the north of the site outlined in red. Next slide, please. The area shows the subject property rectangular in shape outlined in red and surrounding land uses to various, which lend themselves to various industrial uses. Next slide, please. The site includes the topographical changes and the site is outlined here for your viewing in purple. It shows the environmental features on the subject property. Next slide, please. The property is situated on Harvard Ardmore Road, which can be seen highlighted in brown. And can be drive a collector road shown here highlighted in green. Next slide, please. The bird's eye image shows in a large aerial of the existing property outlined in red. The site is surrounded by industrial uses, and U.S. Highway 50, John Hanson Freeway, can be seen here to the north. Next slide, please. The site then proposes the construction of a 4,649 square feet, two beverage store, and gas station with three standard and, two, and three diesel fuel dispensers. Two points of vehicular access is proposed along Kennedy and one along Ardwick Street and one along Ar Ardwick Ardmore Road. Standard sidewalks are part of this development package and are included as part of the application provided in travel connectivity. Next slide, please. The application contains the required schedule. However, the condition has been included in the staff report to clearly label the location of pylon signs and the loading space. Next slide, please. The applicant has chosen to incorporate leadership in energy and environmental design, sustainable, sustainable building design element, also known as LEED. The proposed retail building achieves a building height of approximately 21 feet and is designed to reflect a rural aesthetic and incorporate a band of composite siding at the top portion of the building and a copper red view. Brick and stone veneers also integrated into the design team uniting all four elevations. Next slide, please. Staff acknowledges that the proposed application has no true rear elevation, but note that the applicant has united the rear elevation to the remaining four three sides of the architectural elevation. <laughs> the applicant has advised that although other locations in the county provide a second patron entrance, there are topographical constraints unique to this site with Provenza. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. 
The application includes building mounted signs and illuminated freestanding and pylon signs that demonstrate conformance with the zoning ordinance. The applicant also proposes two 20 foot tall pylon signs, one on the Hardwick Hardmore Road frontage and one along the Pinty Drive frontage. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Bush. The architecture of the site. That's before the sign is just shown. Excuse me, Mr. Bush. Someone is, does not have their phone on mute, so I'm asking everyone to have their phone on mute. Everyone other than the person speaking. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Bush. Thank you. I'll actually um, repeat this um, for the hearing of all, all viewers. So this particular slide um, includes the building on the sign and illuminated free standing and pylon signs to demonstrate conformance with the zoning ordinance. The applicant proposes two 20 foot Two twenty-five foot tall pylon signs, one in its Ardwick Ardmore Road frontage and one along the Pinty Drive frontage. Staff supports the sign as shown. Next slide, please. This illustration shows the truck access plan, which is in general conformance with the site design guidelines contained in section 27-274 regarding provisions for safe and efficient on-site pedestrian and vehicular circulation, as well as provisions for adequate illumination. Access and circulation have been designed to mitigate the commingling of trucks using the diesel pump and the automobile and pedestrian users of the site. The DSP was found to be in conformance with the requirements of the zoning ordinance, the landscape manual, the woodland and wildlife habitat conservation and tree canopy coverage ordinances. The urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve DSP 19043. Subject to the conditions found in the staff report, the applicant is proposing revised conditions that has evaluated and is in full agreement. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Bush. Now I will now turn to the planning board to see if they have any questions of Mr. Bush at this time. Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Um, Ms. Washington. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Geraldo. No questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Dorner. No, ma'am. Thank you. I will now turn to counsel in this matter. Uh, Mr. Tedesco. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. For the record, Matthew Tedesco with the law firm of Mackinac Hosey here on behalf of Two Farms, Inc., doing business as Royal Farms. Um, if, if the chair would indulge me, I just want to um, make a comment or two in response to the comments that the chair made at the beginning of this hearing, um, I think I speak for all of my colleagues and probably the entire development community. And I, by personally publicly thanking um, the Commission Development Review Division, the, the, the Chair, as well as the Planning Director and all the Commissioners with making sure that in these very difficult, unprecedented times where we are navigating through uncharted waters, um, business is continuing to move as normally as possible. Um, as dictated today by this hearing. So I want to thank everyone personally. Um, it's, a, it's a very challenging time, but also a very scary time for many of us with respect to just being able to move forward with applications. And so I want to take a moment, if I could, um, to just thank everybody involved, everyone on this phone call uh, in this hearing room and um, continuing to, to do the work of the county as well as um, the commission i just want to thank you for that thank you thank you mr tedesco um for your kind comments and i just want to ditto that we are all in this together we're all in this together so we're, we're all trying hard together so thank you very much i'll let you proceed yeah thank you um as uh, mr bush indicated we, we are here today or virtually here today on the detailed side plan for rural farms uh, I believe this is probably the seventh or eighth Royal Farms that the board has reviewed. So I don't know if I need to spend a lot of time going through all the, the details. Mr. Bush did a fantastic job of advising and going through the staff report. That's accurate, Mr. Um, Tedesco. Yeah. <laughs> Understood, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I do just want to highlight um, one thing. I believe there were two letters submitted in support yesterday. Wait. I think you indicated at the beginning that you received one. No, no. I, I, I mentioned two. two. There's, there's a letter from James Herring also. Is that the okay, other one? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, the other item, just a point of clarification, and we have Mr. Bainbridge and Ms. Leonard from Kimley Horn and Mr. Bainbridge from Royal Farms on the line if needed. But um, in, in our justification statement, as well as in the staff report, staff report on page five, it was indicated that it, there's proposed eight uh, multi-product dispensers. In actuality, there are four multi-product dispensers proposed, but eight fueling positions. So I just wanted to clarify that it's, it's really four uh, uh, pumps in addition to three diesel pumps, but Got it, 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 it references eight. It's really four multi-product dispensers, which equals eight fueling positions, and then the three diesel, uh, high-speed diesel fuel dispensers. Got it. Thank you. Um, yep. The other, the other point of clarification I just wanted to, to mention, and I don't, just an order of process, the 70-day action period on the detailed site plan technically expired on March 19, 2020. Um, given that that hearing was canceled, I, I don't you, know whether you, that you're, you're, automatically told, told the period, but in as much as I need to verbally and maybe subsequently follow up with a written request uh, or acknowledgement of extending the 70 days to today's date, the applicant's happy to do that. Okay, so let me just say, in, in, in accordance with the council, because um, this pertains to the zoning ordinance, in accordance with the council's action on CR 10, um, those deadlines have been postponed, uh, extended for at least 60 days. So you're in, well within your time frame. Okay, thank you thank for you. that. Um, Madam Chair, the only other item that I needed to just offer up with re the exception of indication, indicating our support of the staff report, thanking staff for its review is just the applicant's exhibit one, which we submitted uh, earlier in the week. We do have I believe that. you all have that, which is the revised condition. We do have that, indeed. Uh, we, have, we have gone through those with staff. I think Mr. Bush indicated that they are in full agreement with those. I'm happy to go through each of them nope. um, and clarify any, any if needed. Well, we have them, uh, and I think we're good. The board has them as well. Um, so let me, uh, I think we're good there. Um, and Mr. And Mr. Bush ha did indicate that they're in agreement, and and we've had the chance to review them too. And I and I I don't think that any of the board members had any questions on this, so um, um, we're good. Well, if there's that, Madam Chair, um, I'll I'll I will submit on our justification statement, uh, indicate our uh, acceptance of the staff board provides conditions, and only make a note for the record that in as much as any of the findings um, need to be adjusted as a result of the modification to the conditions. We would ask that that be done with the resolution. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, that is duly noted because the, res the resolution is not before us today, so we will make sure that the findings are consistent with these conditions, p assuming that the, there is a motion that passes on this. So let me see. You do have Mr. Bainbridge and Ms. Leonard signed up. Let me see if they, either of them wishes to speak. Mr. Bainbridge? Madam Chair, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Leonard? Ms. Leonard? Okay. Um, she's good. Okay, she's good. Okay, so let me see if the board members have any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Commissioner uh, Geraldo? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have no questions. Thank you. I, then I will turn to our board to see if there is a motion. Is there a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, uh, and I would like to move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-19043, along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report, uh, and as further revised by applicants' proposed amended conditions, uh, in addition to ensuring that the resolution reflects uh, the technical correction is noted by Mr. Tedesco uh, regarding the pumps, and of course, any adjustments needed to the findings based on the uh, amended conditions also be um, addressed as part of the resolution. Thank Commissioner, you. Uh, um, Madam Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Geraldo. I second that motion. Okay, I'm going to do a roll call. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, Madam Vice Chair? 
But I. Commissioner Washington. I. Commissioner Geraldo. I. Commissioner Dorner. I. Um, the ayes have it five zero. Thank you. Okay, one down. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the detailed site plan 19023, which incorporates the conceptual site plan 02004 for South Lake. Um, I'm going to do a roll call of the persons that I have signed up to speak, so please confirm your um, participation at this time. Adam Bossy? Yes, ma'am. Jill Kosak? Here, ma'am. Arthur Horn? Good morning, Madam Chairman. Here. Kim Finch? Madam Chair, this is Megan Reiser for Environmental Planning. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom Maysock? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Thank you. Um, Frank Stevens from the City of Bowie? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Jonathan Myers? From Chesapeake Realty Partners? We have you signed up as a proponent. Uh, Madam Chair, it's Arthur Horn. Yes, he is. I would have declined. Okay, thank you. Kevin Kennedy? I'm here. Nat Ballard? Yes, ma'am. Charlie Howe? Um, well, Nat Ballard, you're there for Rogers, and the others are here for Rogers, too. Alex Villas? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Um, Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Matt Tedesco. I also signed up for this one as co-counsel with Mr. Horn. Okay, I'm sorry. They um, have you further down. I was getting to your name now. I still have some more. So, okay, Mr. Sorry. Tedesco. Thank you, Mr. Tedesco. So you've indicated your presence. Jamie Atkinson. Yes, ma'am, I'm present. Um, Mike Leonard. Leonard. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Scott Roak. Um, yeah, he's the client manager. Okay, th thank you. Okay, um, so that's it. And and may I ask, is Liz calling on the line? Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Bossy, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, members of the Planning Board. For the record, I am Adam Bossy with the Urban Design Section. Before you is a detailed site plan for South Lake DSP 19023, which was previously scheduled as item six on your March 19th agenda. Before starting, I would like to point out that three additional items were submitted regarding this case prior to noon yesterday. These items were entered into the record and published online for public viewing. Uh, these materials consisted of a memorandum from staff with proposed revisions to the technical staff report based on input received from the City of Bowie. Uh, the second item were two attached letters from the City of Bowie. And the third item is a memorandum submitted by the applicant with clarifications and proposed revisions to recommended conditions included in the staff report. Okay, Mr. Bossi, let me stop you for a second. I have three items here, but I only have one letter from the City of Bowie. Did you just say there are two? Yes, ma'am. They were included uh, together. One letter is dated March 4th. The other is dated March 10th. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, DSP 19023 for Southlake proposes the development of 1,035 dwelling units, an amendment to the conceptual site plan CSP 02004 as part of the larger Southlake mixed-use plan community. Next slide, please. The property is located in Planning Area 74A, Council District 4, and is within the municipal limits of the City of Bowie. Next slide, please. The subject property outlined in red is in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of Maryland 214 Central Avenue and US 301 Robert Crane Highway. Next slide, please. As shown on the zoning map, uh, the site is uh, zoned Employment and Institutional Area, that's the EIA zone, which is a comprehensive design zone. On the site itself is two, approximately 283 acres. Next slide, please. Uh, in purple to the north of the site are Maryland 214 Central Avenue and a portion of Old Central Avenue, 
both of which are classified as expressways. Uh, in red to the east of the site is US 301 Robert Crane Highway, which is classified as an arterial roadway where it abuts this site. Next slide, please. The aerial image shows that the site uh, was undeveloped vacant land that was predominantly wooded. Uh, it's our understanding that site preparation activities, including clearing, are underway currently. And this activity was previously reviewed and approved by the board under DSP 05042 02. Uh, this was an infrastructure only DSP that the board first approved in 2005. And its most recent revision was approved by the planning director in February of this year. Next slide, please. Someone needs to mute. Yeah, may I, may I remind everyone to please mute your phones? Thank you. Uh, as the site map here shows, the site does have a rolling topography with steeper slopes concentrated on the western portion of the site, uh, where it transitions uh, to a lower area associated with the Collington Branch Stream Valley. Next slide, please. Uh, given the scale of this development, size of the site, unfortunately the bird's eye image does not really provide us any greater detail than the aerial image did. Next slide, please. This illustrative plan provides an overall view of the entire South Lake mi mixed-use plan community. Areas shown in color are part of the subject DSP and proposed main residential phase of the development consisting of 1,035 dwelling units. These units include 128 two-family attached units, which are shown in gold adjacent to the intersection of Old Central Avenue and US 301, that is in the northeasternmost portion of the property. Uh, there are 562 single-family attached units. These are townhouses shown in tan, which are just to the west of the two-family homes. And 345 single family detached units, which are shown in a brighter shade of yellow, which essentially go from north to south across the central portion of the site. Uh, development in South Lake uh, that is illustrated in black and white is not subject to this DSP and will be proposed in separate future applications. Uh, on this slide, we also see a central clubhouse with an indoor recreation facilities and outdoor recreation facilities provided south to the southwest of the south of the townhouse development. Uh, these are also adjacent to the two-tier ponds located centrally in the development. Recreation features will be shown more clearly on future slides. Next slide, please. The conceptual site plan for the site, CSP-02004, was approved by the board in June 2013 with resolution 03-135. This DSP proposes to amend the CSP so that it matches changes to the previously approved design that have been made through uh, two preliminary plans of subdivision and the DSP for infrastructure, as well as those changes proposed by this DSP. The site's long history of zoning approvals is detailed on pages five and six of the technical staff report. Key features of the conceptual site plan proposed to be amended through this DSP are the overall road and lot layout, mix of residential unit types, design change for the central lake feature, and relocation of the Collington Branch master plan trail from the stream valley on the west side of the site to the east side of the site's uh, main north-south spine roadway. Staff is in support of these changes and the amendment to the CSP. Next slide, please. The site plan provides an overall view of the current DSP application and applications plan for future retail, commercial, and multifamily development as part of the mixed use plan community. Uh, the area is generally uh, uh, along the eastern portion of the site, labeled with various DSP numbers, are future applications that are planned to be submitted. Uh, the slide also illustrates the limits of the two preliminary plans for the site. One encompasses the vast majority of the site. The second uh, encompasses the hatched area in the north central portion of the site. Also shown are areas on the western portion of the site that are to be dedicated to the Parks Department for passive uh, recreation. And um, in the northeast corner of the site where the two over two units are present, uh, there are shown some of the noise mitigation lines. Several of those units will require uh, noise mitigation. Next slide, please. 
Uh, to the master plan trail slide, please. Yes, thank you. Shown in red is the proposed location of the Collington Branch Master Trail. It's highlighted in red again on that north-south spine road through the site. The original approved location of the trail was within the stream valley on the far western portion of the site. DPR, uh, the applicant, as well as DRD and the city of Bowie worked together and determined that this location uh, was unfortunately non-feasible due to the presence of extensive environmental features. And the decision was made and agreed upon to move it to its location as shown here. Uh, the location and construction details for this trail were previously approved by the infrastructure DSP 05042-02. Um, and off-site, uh, eventually in the future, this trail is envisioned to continue south along Prince George's Boulevard and provide a connection to the Liberty Sports Complex as well as Collington Center. To the north, it's envisioned to cross Maryland 214 and then continue north uh, back into the Stream Valley. The orange dashed lines that we see illustrated uh, in the central portion of the property are for a proposed trail system uh, that is part of this DSP. The orange star that is shown on the uh, plan is a future trailhead location to be proposed as part of one of the future DSP applications for commercial development. Next slide, please. Maybe a little difficult to see on this slide, but ample parking is provided throughout this residential development. A total of 2,093 parking spaces are required, and 3,976 have been provided. Uh, this number is inclusive of driveway and garage parking spaces. Most of the units proposed uh, have at least two parking spaces, but many have four, two in the driveway and two in the garage. An additional 420 spaces are provided uh, on street for resident and guest use. Uh, a total of 55 spaces are provided at the clubhouse. This is less than the 69 spaces that would normally be required. Uh, however, uh, this was determined to be acceptable as there are 22 on street parking spaces provided directly adjacent to the clubhouse. Uh, in addition, uh, the proposed development conforms with the applicable requirements of the Prince George's County Landscape Manual, Woodland Conservation and Tree Preservation Ordinance, and Tree Conservation Coverage Ordinance, as discussed on page 35 of the Technical Staff Report. Next slide, please. Uh, the orange dots on this image represent the location of 12 on-site recreation areas to be provided for the development. These include a mix of playgrounds, open play areas, pocket parks, trails, and the clubhouse complex. Recreation amenities are clustered closer to the townhouse development and central public uh, space surrounding the ponds and clubhouse as required by prior approvals. Next slide, please. So the main recreation feature that is to be provided is the clubhouse complex. Uh, it is proposed to include indoor facilities, such as a facility room, yoga studio, game room, conference room, and a party room. Adjacent to the building outside will be a patio, kiddie pool, swimming pool, and a sport court, as well as access to the trails that I previously described. Next slide, please. The only architecture proposed with this detailed site plan is for the clubhouse. The remaining residential architecture is proposed uh, under DSP 19024, which is the next case on your agenda. The clubhouse design is essentially two buildings connecting with an exterior breezeway uh, with the facades uh, covered with a brick water table and cementitious siding. Next slide, please. The DSP does provide details of the recreation amenities and general layout of the recreation areas that are proposed. Uh, these images just provide you with a quick snapshot of what those are. And next slide, please. Three project identity signs are proposed. Uh, they are, as you can see here, they are all similar in design and material selection. It includes a stone base with a laser cut uh, steel sign with a bird emblem on as part of it. And then finally, in conclusion, this detailed site plan for the first building phase of, of South Lake's mixed use plan community conforms to the applicable requirements of the zoning ordinance, subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the technical staff report. 
Uh, again, referring back to those documents that were received before noon yesterday and published online, uh, they have proposed a series of revisions for staff and the applicant. And as noted, at, uh, excuse me, and development revision, uh, development review division staff, the applicant and city of Bowie are in agreement with the revisions provided in both memos. With that, staff recommends the planning board approve DSP 19023 and TCP 2. 126-05-03 with the conditions included in the technical staff report as revised by the two memorandums from the applicant and staff received yesterday. That concludes okay. our presentation, Madam Chairwoman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bossi. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, I believe, that you're saying it's we're going forward with your staff recommendation as contained in the staff report and as amended by the um, conditions proposed by um, the city of Bowie and uh, to some extent and, to, and the applicant and as incorporated in your March 25th uh, memo. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair? Not at this time, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Washington? Uh, none at this time, thank you. Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, just a quick question on the trailhead that's going to be there. Do you know what that's going to look like or if it's going to have any kind of like a water fountain um, next to it or if the big inverted um, parking area is going to have water fountains or, or schools or anything around them? Uh, thank you for your question, Commissioner Dorner. So the applicant, it, it's our understanding the applicant does propose uh, or will propose that as part of the future retail development in the southeast corner of the site, uh, which will be a commercial application. Uh, we don't have any details about that yet in this application, uh, but um, you know, the uh, applicant may have more details to discuss about that uh, at this time. Okay. Uh Okay, so um, Commissioner Geraldo? Uh, Chair, I have no questions. Uh, I, I'm just sharing the question of uh, Commissioner Dorn. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, now I'll turn to Council, Mr. Horn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the Planning Board, for the record, Arthur Horn, the law office of Shipley and Horn, very pleased to uh, speak with you all through technology uh, and uh, glad to uh, be able to move forward. And I echo uh, with my co-counsel in this case, uh, again, from Mackinley Holding, Mr. Matt Tedesco indicated to appreciate uh, the efforts by all of uh, Park and Planning staff uh, and not only trying to move forward, but in specifically uh, this application uh, that this board has seen uh, many times before. Uh, I'm uh, here along with Mr. Tedesco representing uh, South Lake Partners LLC. You mentioned some of the names, Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. John Mayers, uh, Mr. Scott Rout, Mr. Jamie Atkinson. Uh, they are also uh, as partners with the NAI Micro Companies who are represented by Mr. Gary Michael, uh, Mr. Kevin Kennedy, and Mr. Julian Curry. Uh, you heard from uh, Rogers Engineering, uh, Alex uh, Villegas, uh, Mr. Nat Ballard. By the way, I'm stopping Nat for a second. He's the uh, technological genius that we have here. So if there's any uh, issues uh, that we may need to discuss, you know, with reference to technology, uh, as well as uh, perhaps some of the layout, uh, I'll be calling upon Mr. Ballard to do so. Also, uh, Charlie Howe uh, is with Rogers Engineering. Uh, but there's another engineering firm working on this matter as well, Ben Dyer Associates, uh, Mr. Paul Woodburn and Mr. Michael Petrakis uh, are uh, part of the project uh, for the uh, traffic. We had uh, Lenhart Traffic Consultants and Mr. Michael Lenhart. Uh, I do uh, understand that we're not talking about any of the um, architecture in this application. That application is coming up next, but uh, certainly, I understand representative from NVR and perhaps Mid Atlantic may also be on the phone. I'm not sure about that as well. Um, Madam Chairman, as uh, Mr. Bossi, who has done an outstanding job of uh, laying out why we're here today, uh, has indicated this application started back in the mid 1970s. And, uh, though I've been practicing a long time, I have to say I was not the attorney. Uh, back in 1975 when this all started, 
but uh, certainly uh, by the time it reached the 80s and the 90s, uh, uh, you know, we've been a, a part of the application process to try to get this uh, fantastic mixed use project moving forward. And by the time we reached the turn of the century here, uh, both uh, Mr. Tedesco and I have had the honor of appearing before the board uh, for preliminary plans, for reconsideration, previous detailed site plans, and, and to see uh, the product that uh, come out now, and this is phase one of the uh, total overall project that you've heard so much about. Again, this uh, is only 283 acres of the 392 or so acres of the site, dealing with the uh, first uh, 1,000 uh, dwelling units, that 1,035, and as Mr. Bosley indicated, it laid out the uh, uh, the breakdown between the two over two, the townhouses, the single family attached and the single family attached uh, unit. And uh, with uh, that, Madam Chairman, I'll say that um, we, we certainly agree with staff recommendations, their findings and conclusions. As you know, this property has been annexed in the city of Bowie, so uh, we have been before the city on several occasions for uh, both the uh, this, this particular application and the one that follows, uh, and we certainly concur with their uh, assessment and with their uh, recommendation as well, as, as Mr. Bott has indicated, has been assimilated into uh, this uh, particular approval recommendation. Um, with reference to uh, Commissioner Dorner and uh, Commissioner Geraldo's question about the trailhead, I do know that, again, that that's coming later with, uh, with the upcoming commercial uh, DSP that's coming down the pike. And I just, you know, I, I would say maybe Mr. Kennedy of the Michael Company, as many of y'all may know, Gary Michael is an avid uh, bike rider and, and is very familiar with uh, with these trails and trailheads and the type of things they have. So uh, it, it's going to be a top of the line matter. As far as the design, I do not believe it has been uh, set up just as of yet, but I will defer uh, perhaps to Mr. Kennedy if he if he knows anything more specific. Uh, Mr. Kennedy? Yes, sure. Just very briefly, and, and thank you all. Um, we have put together some conceptual design ideas for the trailhead. Part of the reason for locating it where it is in the project adjacent to the commercial is that uh, the intention is that it will be close to um, you know, restaurant facilities, cafes, things of that nature, so people can get food or drink um, after riding or while taking a break from riding. But in addition to that, we're looking at uh, features like a covered area, maybe a small pavilion with benches, uh, uh, repair, um, gosh, I forget what it's called, but the, the tool stand that you see on some bike trail areas, and we are also looking into how best to accommodate a water bottle facility as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. So you're not a biker, huh? Okay. Um, so um, let me let. Was that it for you, Mr. Horn, at this time? <laughs> Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to, just to reiterate that we do uh, agree with, uh, as Mr. Bozzi said, with the staff findings of the facts and conclusions as amended by uh, both the uh, city of Bowie and the applicant. Okay, let me, um, does your co-counsel have anything to say, Mr. Tedesco? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, no comments. I um, uh, agree with and align myself with Mr. Horn's comment. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I see other names on this list. I don't know if Mr. Curry's a, a biker as well, but I'll, I'll proceed. So let me see, uh, let me turn now to the city of Bowie. Mr. Stevens? Yes, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Frank Stevens from the city of Bowie. Uh, the Bowie City Council reviewed this case on um, uh, December 2nd and March 2nd, and uh, after a public hearing, um, recommended approval with conditions. Uh, that letter is dated March 4th. Uh, that's what was sent to the planning board uh, from the mayor. Uh, all of our conditions have, from that letter have been included in uh, your staff's um, <clears throat> revised memo dated uh, March 25th. Um, 
and we're very grateful to have worked with uh, your staff and the applicant on this case. Uh, that concludes the city's uh, comments at this time. Thank you so much. Um, so let me ask this question. We have um, a number of people signed up as um, set forth on our list, and Mr. Horn, as you so indicated, but do any of your team folks need to speak or care to speak at this time? I, I do not think so, Madam Chairman. I think they stand by what we've already said here already. Okay. If um, if one of you, if Mr. Lenhart or, or any of the representatives of Chesapeake Realty Partners um, or anyone from Rogers or the Michael Companies um, um, has something to add at this point, you, now is your time. If not, I'm calling for a motion. Okay. Um, let me turn to our board members. Okay. I'm assuming there are no more questions after um, after um, Commissioner Dorners and Mr. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo's questions. So with that, there are no other speakers on our list. Um, may I turn for a, for a motion? Is there a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, uh, and I would like to move that we adopt the findings of staff in addition to the revised findings and staff's memo dated March 25th, as well as the amended findings outlined in uh, the applicant's proposed memo, and approve DSP-19023 and TCP-2-126-05 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report, uh, as well as the uh, revised conditions outlined in staff's memo dated March 25, 2020, in addition to the amended conditions as outlined in uh, the uh, applicant's uh, memo. Um, there's no date on it, but it's applicant proposed amended conditions. Okay. Uh, Second. We have a, second. So we have a um, motion from Commissioner Washington and a second from Vice Chair Bailey. Um, I'm going to go down the, the list. Madam Vice Chair? I vote aye. Uh, Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. The ayes have it 5-0. Thank you so much. We will now turn to item 7, which is detailed site plan 19024, South Lake, the umbrella architecture. Okay. Um, I, let me do a roll call to see who's present on this. I, I, the presenter is Mr. Zhang. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Kozak? Yes, present. Um, Mr. Horn? Present. Uh, Mr. Stevens? Yes, present. And I'm going to go on down this list. It seems to be pretty much the same people from the other case, but Jonathan Mayers, um, Kevin Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy. They all have I know, but I got to go down the list and call to confirm. Uh, um, I'm here. Nat Ballard. Present. Charlie Howe. Alex Viegas. Present. Matt Tedesco. Present. Jamie Atkinson. Present. Mike Leonard, Lenhart. Present. Jessica McMahon. Present. Scott Rout. Present. Did I pronounce it correctly? Probably not. Okay. Close enough. Okay, close enough. Okay. That concludes my list. And I, may I say we also have... Um, our legal counsel, um, David Warner, and I know Deborah Borden on all of these cases, so I just want to say that as well. Um, we, we have um, Sherry Connor present and, and also um, the um, acting deputy director, Derek Village present in the room as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Zhang? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the planning board. Uh, for the record, this is Henry Zhang, reserving his eye section. Before you is DSP 19024, it's umbrella architecture for South Lake, which was uh, scheduled previously as item 7 on the planning board agenda on March 19, 2020. 
Before I start my presentation, I'd like to point out that two additional items has been submitted, one being the resolution from the city of Bowie, and the other is the applicant's proposed revision to staff recommended conditions. Uh, those two items were received prior to 12 o'clock noon yesterday. They were entered into the record and published online for viewing by the public. And then we will be talking about those two items later on in the presentation. Thank you. Um, the, this DSP is an approval of umbrella architecture uh, for 24 single family detached models, 13 single family attached townhouse models, and then two, two over two, uh, two family uh, models by NV Homes, Ryan Homes, and Mid Atlantic Builders. No improvements of any kind proposed in this detailed site plan. Uh, the site basically covered everything uh, as uh, the planning board just heard in DSP 19023, uh, which is located in the southwest quadrant of intersection of MD 214 and the US 301 in plain area 74A, Council District 4. And then the city of Bowie recently annexed the site. So it is located within the uh, municipal boundary of the city of Bowie. Next slide, please. This site is in a mixed use planted community in the employment and in institutional areas, EIA zone, but had to follow the development standards in the MXT zone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the site basically vacant and also has been uh, graded recently based on previously approved infrastructure details type plan. Next slide, please. Uh, this site has a very long approval history that can be dated back to the 1970s. Uh, in 1975, Prince George's County District Council approved Zoning Map Amendment A-9248 to rezone the subject site uh, to the EIA zone, and then known as a part of College and Center development. Most recently, in 2006, Bowie's vicinity master plan retained the property in the EIA zone. And then this site has a numerous previous approval, uh, which those are relevant to the, the review of this ESP include CSP 02004, uh, preliminary plan of subdivision 4-17027, and then 4-04035, as well as the infrastructure detail site plan 05042. Uh, the district council adopted the CD 73 2016, which provides a very specific requirement for review of this detail site plan. Uh, as I stated previously, uh, this DSP only includes the uh, architecture, uh, specifically uh, 20 seven single family detached model, which range in size from 1421 to 4290s for feet. That will provide many housing options to meet the housing demand in the area. The single family attached uh, included in this application range in size from 1688 uh, to 2824 square feet. Uh, those models are designed in a very popular uh, style in the areas and they include many high quality detail options such as uh, brick jack headers, keystone treatment, decorative cross gables, dormer windows, and so on. And then there's two two over two model also included in this uh, application by Ryan Home which has been reviewed and approved by the planning board several times previously. Uh, These models will utilize uh, numerous uh, green building techniques 
uh, which has been discussed in detail on page eight to nine of the staff report. As I stated previously, uh, this uh, development is under the mixed use planted community as defined in section 27107, specifically governing by the design standards listed in CB 73-2016 include the standards for townhouses and single-family detaches and also as, a, as well as the multi-family and then specifically uh, on staff report page 9 to 14 uh, those standards in MXT zones specifically 27544E, 27546E are also discussed in detail uh, in the staff report this DSP also satisfied the requirement of previously approved CSP 02004 and also two preliminary plan of subdivision and one's infrastructure detail assignment. The slide shows 8 to 24 are all those models and then show the front elevations as well as the side and the rear elevations. Okay. Uh, I will not go. Are we are, are we on the right door. slide? Are we on the right slide right now, Mr. Zhang? Because I'd like to get to slide. I, um, I'd like to get to slide yeah. nine so we can see them. Thank you. Okay, should be on slide eight. That's the uh, starting of the architectural models. And then all the slides until the last That's, twenty-four. Okay, so slide uh, nine. Slide nine starts the models. Yeah. Okay. And it, since this is the umbrella infrastructure a DSP, the requirements yeah. of landscape menu, tree canopy coverage, and woodland wildlife habitat conservation ordinance will all be reviewed at the time of full detail cycle, like the, the board just reviewed one uh, 19023. And this one, we don't have uh, anything specifically. And then no agency opposed to approval of this detailed site plan. Uh, I'd like to point out to the planning board that the city of Wu will review this umbrella approval in a very different way than what we uh, usually do. That's why they have uh, uh, numerous conditions specifically related to each model, and then which we agree to. But uh, I think uh, I'd like to let plenty more know that the condition we propose, which will cover all those requirements proposed by the applicant, I mean by the city, excuse me. And this the city recently annexed this site, and then therefore the applicant had to work with the city, and also they agree to work with the city to address those uh, conditions. And uh, the applicant proposed some minor revision to the staff recommendations and conditions. And then we had a, a thorough discussion with them several times before uh, 12 o'clock yesterday. And then we are in general agree with the changes. With that, this will conclude the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zhang. Uh, allow me to ask the planning board members if they have any questions. Madam Vice Chair? Yeah, a quick question. Uh, he referenced the conditions uh, indicated by the city of Bowie. Are they reflected in the conditions what? that in the final report? Uh, no, Madam Chair. For the record, this is Henry Zan. Uh, no, uh, because our condition provides more flexibility uh, for the applicant. And uh, we didn't include each model, but our condition is very uh, overarching, which will include the situation uh, envisioned by the city. So uh, maybe we should do this. Uh, let, let me see if there are other questions, and then um, uh, uh, Mr. Horn can address, and as well as Mr. Stevens, and uh, because okay. there may be there may be some measure of acceptance of which we are unaware. So let's see, or not. Um, okay, so Madam Vice Chair, do you have other questions at this time? No. no. Okay. No, uh, Commissioner Geraldo? Um, no, Madam Chair, I just share questions raised by, uh, by uh, Vice Chair. Okay. Bailey. 
Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner uh, Washington? Commissioner uh, my question was also the same and also I wanted to indicate that um, we did not or at least I did not receive the uh, city of Bowie letter uh, that Mr. Zhang referenced. I understand. I understand. It's it, it's going to you uh, right now. It was posted online. I didn't have it either, so it's coming now. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. So you want you you will take it all at the end and kind of resolve yes. where we are in the city. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Dorner. No, not for staff. I have a question for Mr. Corner, whoever the, the applicant's attorney will be at later on, just the minor details and stuff, but I can bring that up after they're done. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there are no other questions at this time. Um, all right, Mr. Horn, you're on. Thank you very much again, Madam Chairman. Once again, Arthur Horn of the Office of Shipfield Horn in Largo, Maryland, uh, along with uh, my co counsel from Maxley Hosey, Mr. Machinesco. I'm uh, sorry, I'm going to go through that list again very quickly, Madam Chairman, because uh, it's pretty much the same. We're here representing South Lake Partners LLC, represented by Mr. John Mayers, Mr. Scott Robb, Mr. Jamie Atkinson, <clears throat> also a partner to NAA and Michael Company, represented by Mr. Gary Michael, Mr. Kevin Kennedy, and Mr. Julian Curry. Uh, the, our engineering firms, Rogers Engineering, we have Alex Viegas, uh, Nat Ballard, and Charlie Howe. And for Ben Dyer, uh, we have uh, Paul Woodburn and Mike Patrickus. And our traffic engineer is Mr. Uh, Mike Lenhart from Lenhart Traffic Consultants. I did hear that uh, from NDR, Mr. Jessica McMahon uh, was on the phone and able to join us as well. Um, uh, again, this is the um, umbrella architecture to discuss the, uh, the, 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 the what it looks like, what the units look like that we just had approved uh, in the previous 03 application. And uh, again, it's Mr. Zhang, and I want to thank him very much for uh, going through uh, the application uh, with us, that it, uh, it covers over two townhouses, uh, both for condo and fee simple, a single family uh, uh, detached uh, units, and a variety of uh, different uh, sizes and looks. And uh, in this particular case, again, as you'll hear from Mr. Stevens, we went in front of the city of Bowie, and when we were coming through the application process the first time, uh, we didn't have some of these units, but after meeting with the city of Bowie and the citizens, one, one of the things they spoke about was the, the fact that some of the, uh, the living place type of uh, uh, desire now were for our seniors. And although we don't have quote unquote senior housing, we have units that uh, have masters on the first floor uh, that, uh, and, and smaller in nature that will allow for uh, seniors to be able to uh, enjoy staying in the Bowie area, which I understand that they indicated that they don't have a lot of those type of housing. So they were very pleased to go back and offer those type of units as well. Um, we talked about uh, also her the community, uh, their concern about affordability, uh, knowing that, uh, that, you know, these houses, the townhouses and stuff with the starting price and the, uh, you know, some in the 400,000 that uh, some of these units may uh, be able to go into 300,000 uh, for more affordability. So uh, we were very pleased to be able to offer a variety of type of uh, units and stuff for this mixed use the community. Um, as we mentioned, we uh, have worked very closely with the city of Bowie and, and uh, their recommendations as far as the housing time. Uh, we have in the, we have uh, submitted. Uh, our recommended recommended changes to the conditions only a few, uh, you know, one A uh, and then uh, D, and uh, otherwise the revised findings speak of the city of Bowie's letter, which the applicant is in full support of, and um, you know, certainly we we're here to answer any questions. You heard the whole list of people we have here. Yes. We can answer any questions you have, but um, so I just want to say officially 
that the applicant is in support of the findings of fact and the conclusions set forth uh, along with the conditions uh, as amended uh, by the uh, applicant's exhibit number one, which we believe uh, incorporates the city of Bowie's letter to the planning staff. Okay. So um, thank thank you, Mr. Horn. Um, so so right now everything until we hear from the city of Bowie and if and less than until they say something to the contrary, um, everything is contained in your revised your proposed revised conditions to our technical staff conditions. And and, and the oh, revised correct. and the revised finding as well. Okay. Uh, let me see if there if the um, board members have any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions. Thank you for that clarifying comment. Okay. Um, yeah. Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, Mr. Horn, just on the architecture of these, I just have a couple of questions because I live in a model that's similar to what you guys are doing, not on the single family detached, I'm fine with those, but on the townhomes or the two by twos, those kinds of units, um, I, I just wanted to clarify, there's sort of two options in the staff report and some of the revisions you have on the balcony which would be on the top floor um probably numerically the fourth floor or third depending on how you're, you're counting um and then there's also a porch on on the second floor which is probably the main kind of living room level um just a sort of feedback a lot of our neighbors have sort of reluctantly figured out after the homes have turned over and we've had second purchasers so not the original owners um, they, they're reluctantly trying to figure out ways how to add on the porches on that second floor um, because it's it's just good for having grills and just to kind of get out there when you're you're on the kitchen to have plants or herbs or different things right off the kitchen level. Um, so I want to clarify that those are, are going to be sort of standard features that you have to opt out of or maybe not even have that, that option. Um, and then the second point is on security. Um, on some of the the units as you're looking, not the ones that have the garages on the front that are street facing, but the ones that have the um, front doors on the front levels. We've had package theft in our neighborhood quite frequently, um, and we've been able to catch it with some of the um, some of the, the options and even give over the videos to the police using Nest um, uh, or any of those sort of other doorbell cameras on there. The problem with some of the units being built right now is that the doors are recessed back. Um, obviously, because they're, they're underneath a, a canopy or, or sort of a doorstep. But to the extent that you can have these doorbells come out a little bit slightly, um, or have cameras that are that are above the doorbells, that would, I think, be good for security purposes. Um, not just for, for packages on the, the doorsteps themselves, but also parking on the streets, because that's how we've provided video footage to um, the police that they they don't have the options for that. So they've been installing kind of mobile platforms in some areas that people don't have enough cameras on. But it, I think it's very helpful from sort of a security um, standpoint of the community. Uh, well, uh, let me see, maybe, maybe this McMahon I know is, is on. She may be able to address it. I'm not sure of the options that perhaps the, the NVR may, may be able to offer. <laughs> Arthur, this is Jessica McMahon um, from NVR um, for the record. Um, Commissioner Dorner, we actually, um, we, we, I'll speak to your security question first. We actually agree with you um, that, you know, our customers as technology continues to increase um, are more and more concerned about security and with all of these different types of doorbells um, offered from the various companies, um, I know, you know, even in my own neighborhood myself, um, have been able to verify that packages have been, you know, either misplaced or not ever dropped off, or in this case, as you're mentioning, you know, may have been taken. Um, we've done a lot of surveying with our customers, and our general response right now is we're not including those types of doorbell standard or offering them as options right now. And the only reason for that is because of the ease of being able to install them aftermarket and general opinion of our buyers being that they want to be able to choose technology that they want versus being forced into particular technology, especially because it's changing so rapidly. Uh, I'm fine with that, that option. And, and yeah, I, I took off the doorbell that was installed initially on my home because it was, it was terrible. Um, so I, I have a much better doorbell that has video and stuff on it. 
The problem, though, isn't necessarily the choosing. The, the problem is the actual architecture itself, because a lot of times the the width. So I don't know if you can see my camera, but like the width on the width on the doors is just too narrow. Like it, it's at it needs to be at point set a little bit over point seven inches um, to actually fit some of the door bells on there. And some of the standard commercial products are, are just wider than the doorbell or the door frames themselves. And they're also too far in. So you have a, a, a recess in too much where if you have 120 degrees of viewing um, width on there, you're actually only getting like 70 degrees or 90 degrees because they're, they're too far inside. So it, it's kind of ugly what some of the options people have done, but they've just gotten like huge chunks of wood just to kind of extend things out because the builders are building them too far recessed in. Um, and that that's just kind of created a, a deterrence from people actually trying to have those cameras around. And some people who are installing them don't even realize that that's a problem until afterwards. Um, so to the extent that you can kind of work on the framing of the doors to be a little bit wider and then maybe not as um, recessed in, I think that would be helpful even if you don't install um, a particular kind of uh, doorbell or camera and you leave that up to the clients themselves later on. Yeah, that, that information is actually very helpful. I hadn't heard that feedback specifically before. Um, NVR as a company has an in-house architecture department and we of course are always looking to improve and develop our products. So I certainly will, I, I've actually made note of that um, specific comment and we'll certainly have to go internally, you know, as we continue to tweak our product. Um, and, and as technology continues to increase, um, you know, it may end up being that we do make those changes and or we start to offer more technology as an option uh, throughout the life of this job as well. Um, as we continuously try to revise and develop our product to stay current with um, what our buyers are, are wanting um, and hoping for in their new homes. Okay, thanks. And then just also, as you guys are looking to do, it looks like you're doing the Nest um, thermostats or other like Honeywell or other thermostats throughout the house. Yes, that's um, correct. So one of the other problems is, is the Wi-Fi connections as they're going up and down the stairs in the house. It's just not enough for even the extenders aren't good enough um, in there. So I'd encourage you to kind of look at, at in other options for homeowners because they may not be tech savvy enough to figure out how do you actually complete the entire um, home being sort of mapped out. And it, and it depends on what kind of tech you're using, if, if it's Zigbee or, or what kind of like Wi-Fi network and mapping is, is happening. Um, but there are some standard products out there to get to get better extenders that aren't necessarily being included in, in homes on market. And I say that not just for my home builder, but other units that I've gone through um, that are under construction right now, they're just not doing a good job at extending the, the signals themselves up from the, the ground level. That's where you have an office, like I'm sitting in right now, up until the fourth floor where the signal just won't rise high enough. It won't be strong enough. But I bought a couple of commercial products and I have 125 megabytes per second kind of going up and down the stream really quickly if you improve it. Yep, I appreciate that comment and I can personally relate to that as well as I just in the last 30 days have bought my extenders for my own home from Comcast directly um, in order to improve the signal of my own house as I navigate my new norm of working from home. So I appreciate it and, and note that comment as well. Thank you. Okay, and then do you guys have anything on the back porches that maybe Mr. Warren can, can speak to that? But Yeah, and just to clarify, was your comment um, on the porches that we're speaking of, or are we talking about the two over two condos, the Matisse and the Picasso, or are we uh, talking about the townhomes or, or both? So I, I don't have the, the, the slide. It looks like the slides that we're on that were shared today are slightly different than the slides that I had. Um, when, when I was looking at the slides, on, on any of the ones that are opening on to the back of the house, you have a um, it looks like the, there's the Ryan Home ones that have um, some of the, the architectural back end where you've got a porch on the fourth floor and then on the second floor, a balcony that kind of comes out um, on the slide that, that's being shown right now. Um, any of those that, that have the townhomes that are either two over twos or that are um, just a regular townhome that's four stories. Having that second story balcony is is essential to kind of getting people out, especially if you don't have a fourth floor um, porch to kind of go out on. Um, a lot of people are kind of realizing that in some of the developments around here that that's that's a very important feature of the house. 
um, to either have a grill or a seating area or just something else side to kind of promote the interactions and then getting on it. Especially now as, as we're, we're kind of locked in and, and having atmosphere even. Yep, we agree with that comment. So on our, I'll speak just separately on the two products. On the two over two condo product, our decks are standard. So the first two levels of that product have a cantilever deck, um, which is four by 10. And then we um, have a new two over two product that you see here where the top level units, which are the third and fourth levels, um, actually have a recessed covered balcony that's eight by 24, that's technically on the third level. Um, and then speaking to the townhomes, which you see up on the screen right now, um, because we do offer third and fourth floor product, we do offer that cantilever deck off of the kitchen level as an option for all of our customers. Um, and we will do that here. Oftentimes we include that as a part of our NF package to buyers, but it is something that's an option uh, for all of our buyers to choose so they can have that outdoor living um, if, if they so choose off of the kitchen level and aren't just limited to attic space if they choose a fourth floor unit. Okay, yeah, I would, I would suggest making that as an option that they can decline or opt out of rather than opt into. Because a lot of times it, it's easier to, people can pick either way, right? But if you have them opting out, they're more likely to get the, the option itself um, and then they won't regret it later on because it's, it's really hard to kind of go back in and add it later on if you don't choose it. I, I hear what you're saying. Typically, the only reason we offer it as an incentive or an optional feature is because when you start to include too much standard for a buyer looking to get in a home who might be trying to hit a price point and, and, and looking for home ownership that might not otherwise be afforded, uh, not be able to afford it. We, um, we sometimes struggle with the fact that if we include too much in the base home, it drives the base price up and, and it limits affordability for folks who may, may have otherwise been able to purchase the product. But I hear what you're saying, and we'll certainly take that into consideration as we, you know, get closer to opening for sales and, and get ready to market this product. Yeah, my guess is that a porch doesn't really cost that much if you amortize it over 30 years. I, I, I understand the affordability concern. Um, I would be more concerned with adding on, like, steel kind of railings on stairways for $10,000 versus a $5,000 porch um, over a 30-year amortization. I think there's a lot more... Um, resale value and just a lot more utility in, in terms of the health and kind of getting people outside and having options um, instead of being inside all the time. Okay, let me do this. Let me do this because they're going to take, I appreciate the questions. They're going to take that under advisement and we do want to hear. We've got a lot of people, oh, other people signed up. I want to see if, was that the rest of your questions at this time, Mr. Dorner, before we get to the applicant? Yeah, that's it. Okay, and, and then we're going to go to, um, um, Commissioner Geraldo, did you have any questions? The, the only question I have is with regards to the with regards to the construction of the balconies. How is that tied? Is that tied into the frame? Yes, that's correct. On the cantilever balcony, there's typically a ledger board that's there um, on the back of the home. Okay, and and what's is it? What's the construction of the material? Um, that typically depends um, by community um, and what we agree to in terms of architectural standards with the developer, whether it's wood, pressure treated wood, or or a mixture of that and vinyl. Okay. Um, well, I guess my concern was what Commissioner Joyner raised earlier. If people are putting um, barbecues out on the, on those decks, you know what I mean. In, in many cases, um, what either the HOA or the local jurisdiction technically prohibits. Um, something that could be considered a fire hazard. I, I don't want to speak to what Prince George's County's requirements are or prohibitions are specifically because I don't I don't know. Um, I do know that some jurisdictions allow electric, but not gas or charcoal. Um, but but typically we make sure we spell that out with homeowners, and that's covered either in jurisdictional requirements and or HOAs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Okay, so let's everybody else mute. Um, let's now turn to the uh, Mr. Horn. Did you have anything else? Uh, uh, no, ma'am. Uh, I just wait for the city of Bowie. Okay, I'm coming to them next. And 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 Mr. Tedesco, did you have anything before I go to the city of Bowie? I'm oh, here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stevens. Yes. Good morning again, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Frank Stevens from the city of Bowie. 
Uh, the Bowie City Council reviewed this case on March 2nd at a public hearing and transmitted its uh, recommendation of approval with conditions in a letter dated March 4th. Uh, first of all, let me mention that uh, we appreciate the opportunity to work with your staff and the applicant on this case um, because the applicant has provided several ranch models in the uh, in their uh, profile of uh, B tax single family units, which uh, is uh, has been a concern of the city council over the years to provide uh, single floor living for um, for senior for senior residents. Uh, with respect to the conditions in our letter, I'll start with uh, the third condition regarding um, uh, noise abatement. Uh, that condition was addressed. Uh, as condition 4A in the previous case in the report for uh, DSP 19023, so that's that's been taken care of. Uh, condition two in our in our letter, uh, I think it's been addressed by the uh, staff as condition 1D in the um, amended items um, uh, that were available yesterday. Uh, with respect to condition one, items A through R, uh, I believe those are generally covered and addressed in, in your staff's conditions, but we've had discussion with uh, the applicant and representatives of the builders um, that uh, our concerns will be addressed and we'll continue to work on those as the project continues to evolve. So I think overall uh, we're in, in general agreement. The, the re updated referral comments have um, included uh, reference to the city's letter of the city's conditions. So I think I think we're pretty well uh, covered by um, by the staff report and by the amended uh, by and by the amended uh, memo. Well, so that um, when the you presentation will be glad to Mr. Yes. Mr. Stevens, when you said the amended memo, are you looking at the um, the amended conditions proposed by the applicant here? Yes. Okay. And so you're okay with those? Okay. That's what I wanted That's to That's correct. I want to make sure what memo we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, Ms. Mr. Horn and Mr. Tedesco, do any of your experts or our team, anyone else on your team, um, have any comments? No, ma'am. At this time. Okay. Do you have anything in summation? Uh, no, ma'am. Just that we, again, just reiterate, we agree with uh, staff's recommendations, their findings and conclusions as amended uh, by applicants. I would believe it's probably number one with a proposed amended findings and proposed amended uh, conclusions. Yes. Um, it, because it was already in the record, I didn't give it, but for purposes of reference, we shall call it Applicants Exhibit Number 1. Okay. And it has the a revised finding 12 and then um, the changes to Condition 1. Okay. Um, does the board have any questions of anyone? Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the board, and then if not, we'll go for a motion. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Geraldo? Questions. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Dorner? No. Okay. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, uh, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff in addition to the amended finding as outlined in applicant exhibit number one and approve DSP-190. Two four, along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report, and again as further amended uh, in applicant exhibit number one. We have a motion, a second by Bailey. Okay, Bailey. Um, okay, Commissioner Washington. Yes. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bailey, Vice Chair Bailey. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, Commissioner Geraldo. Yes. Commissioner Dorner? Yes. Motion carries a 5-0. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay, we're going to proceed with items um, 8 and 9, the detailed site plan and departure from parking and loading standards for the Clinton Veterinary um, Hospital. And, um, and then I think after that we're going to take maybe a 10-minute break because it's needed. And uh, 
and then we will come back and, and hear fairways after that. So let me do a roll call for this one. Uh, Mr. Burke, are you on? If you're not speaking, please turn off your mics. Mr. Burke? Tom Burke? Madam Chair, this is James Hunt. We will get Tom Burke on the, on the line if he's not on there already. I think he is. Okay. Well, let's okay, work on that. Ms. Kosak, you're on. Ms. Kosak? Yes, I'm present. Okay. And I'm working with Tom to oh, okay. see, try and get his connection. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Horn? Present. Um, Mr. Burton? Madam Chair, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schneider? Madam Chair, this is Megan oh, Ryan for Environmental Planning. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, let me change this on my sheet. Uh, uh, Mary Forge Tucker? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. That concludes my sign-up list for this. Um, we also have two exhibits, the applicant's proposed revisions to conditions, and then we also have aerial images. Um, do we have Mr. Burke yet? And if not, we, if we don't have him yet, we can take the 10 minutes now. But if we do have him, let's go forward. Uh, we do not have him yet. This is Jill Kozak. I'm working with him right now, trying to get him back connected. So uh, okay. probably take the 10 minutes. Okay, so why don't we take, idea. we'll take the 10 minutes right now. Thank you. Please stand by. We'll, we'll resume at 10 minutes to 12, okay? Well, well, 8 minutes to 12. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. The Prince George's County Planning Board is back in session after a 10-minute recess. Just to make sure that we are all, all five planning board members are present. Again, I'm going to do a roll call. Madam Vice Chair. Madam Chair. Present. Okay, Madam Vice Chair, you're present. Um, Commissioner uh, uh, Washington. Present. Commissioner Dwarner. Present. Commissioner Geraldo. Present. Okay, thank you. So we are going to proceed with um, items eight and nine, the detailed site plan and uh, um, and departure from parking and loading standards for the Clinton Veterinary Hospital. Mr. Burke, you are now on, right? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. And again, I apologize. No worries. No worries. No worries. Let's go. No worries. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the Planning Board. For the record, I'm Thomas Burke with the Urban Design Section. Uh, the project before you, shown on the agenda as items 8 and 9, it is for Clinton Veterinary Hospital, a detailed site plan DSP 18037, uh, and a departure from parking and loading standards DPLS 463 to reduce the number of parking spaces provided. The applicant is seeking approval of this detailed site plan to develop this 0.52 acre R80 zone property for an addition to the existing animal hospital and veterinary office. <clears throat> Staff recommends that the board incorporate the record from these two cases. Absolutely. Also in your backup should be some additional materials received prior to noon yesterday from the applicant and uh, were posted online. <clears throat> We do have the applicant's proposed conditions and the aerial images, um, and we will incorporate the record of, of, of both cases into one. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, the site is located in the southwest portion of Prince George's County, planning area 81A and Council District 9. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on the east side of Brandywine Road, about a third of a mile south of Woodyard Road in Clinton. Next slide, please. To the north of the site is another commercial use in the R80 zone. To the south and east are residential uses in the R80 zone. And to the west, across Brandywine Road, are properties in the MXP, including Clinton Marketplace South, which was which has recently which, excuse me, which has a recently approved CSP. 
Next slide, please. This aerial photo illustrates the current conditions of the area, showing the existing building and surrounding uses. Next slide, please. There are no regulated environmental features located on this property. The topography is shown with a slope dropping away from Brandywine Road toward the east. Next slide, please. Access to, access to the site is via Brandywine Road, which is a master plan collector roadway. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this bird's eye view better illustrates the existing conditions on, the, on and adjacent to the site. Next slide, please. With this DSP, the applicant is proposing to add a 2,340 square foot addition to the rear of the existing animal hospital. Parking is shown on the front, north side, and rear of the building. However, since the parking in the rear was never permitted, it is being validated with this DSP. Site circulation is also being revised with this application to allow better vehicular flow to the parking in the rear. The existing parking in the front of the building is being redesigned to allow for sufficient space outside of the right-of-way dedication, which DPI is requiring at the time of permit. This reconfiguration will result in the loss of three spaces and therefore the need for the departure. The applicant is seeking departure from the parking and loading standards with three fewer spaces than the 15 spaces required. Revised plans, as shown on this slide, were provided showing the proposed layout with a deficit of only two spaces, but the departure was reviewed and was recommended in the staff report for a reduction of three spaces based on the application. With the statement of justification, the applicant provided a thorough analysis of the current and expected conditions on the site, of which staff agrees and recommends approval. The findings of this request can be found on page 7 of the staff report. However, by providing the reconfigured spaces in front of the building, as shown on the plan, the applicant is unable to fulfill the requirements of the section 4.6 of the landscape manual which requires a planted buffer on the frontage of Brandywine Road, a designated historic road. Next slide, please. As this application is subject to the requirements of the 2010 Landscape Manual, and a landscape plan was provided with the DSP containing schedules demonstrating conformance with the requirements, with the exception of sections 4.6 for landscaping along Brandywine Road and section 4.7 incompatible uses along the northern and southern boundary lines. Alternative Compliance AC-20002 was received, uh, reviewed and the planning director recommends approval of the AC request for the section 4.7 buffer on the north and south boundary lines, the findings of which can be found on page 9 of the staff report. The planning director recommends disapproval of the section 4.6 request along Brandywine Road, determining that the applicant is unable to provide equally effective measures. The applicant did not file a departure from design standards contrary to staff recommendations, and therefore the recommendation is to provide the section 4.6 buffer along the Brandywine Road frontage in accordance with the landscape manual. Next slide, please. The proposed addition is in the rear of the building and is maintaining the residential style of the existing structure. The lower level and front water table walls will be painted with a dark blue with the upper floor in a powder blue. The front facade will have a revised loose, excuse me, a revised roof line with a gable end peak, an awning above the entrance, a large storefront window, and a decorative paw print part impression painted on the southern section. The entrance will also include handicap access to the building. A building mounted sign will be placed beneath the gable. The sign details and a method of illumination were not provided with this application. A condition to provide these details are included in staff's recommendations. The urban design staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSP 18037 
DPLS 468 for a reduction of three spaces from the 15 spaces required and the recommendations of alternative compliance AC 20002, including the approval of the section 4.7 request and disapproval of the section 4.6 request for Clinton Veterinary Hospital, subject to the conditions contained in the staff report dated March 4th, 2020. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, let's see if the board has any questions of you. And at some point, I may turn to um, uh, Mr. Warner for or legal opinion at some point. But um, okay. Madam Vice Chair, any questions? Not at this time. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Not at this time, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? No. Commissioner Washington? No. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Mr. Horn. Uh, let's see. Good afternoon, I guess now, Madam Chair. Once again, uh, Arthur Horn of Office of Shipley Horn in Largo, Maryland. Uh, here representing the veterinary uh, realty LLC doing business at Clinton Veterinary Hospital and it's owned by the uh, Aradon Debrickian. Uh, we uh, have uh, also the engineer, in this case, Joyce Engineering, Mr. Bill Joyce, uh, the architect, in this case, uh, Mr. Ryan Lifford from Arrow Architect, and the land planner from Shipley and Horn with Francis Dibble, in this case. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Berg for his um, recitation of, of what's going on, and, and obviously, uh, as the applicant, we agree with everything the staff has recommended except for the denial of the alternative compliance. <clears throat> and I'll go right to the heart of that. I just want to, just by way of background, to know that if, if in this particular case, this Clinton Veterinary Hospital has been in Clinton at this location and operating since 1955. Very good. At this, and, and this uh, use uh, has been uh, provided for the uh, care of the dogs and cats in the Clinton and extended area for a long time. This this property was considered to be a non-conforming use when the sector plan uh, in that area came in, and uh, to amend to to add this additional use this additional room, which is being used for operational room would have required him to go through a special exception to amend the non-conforming use. So the district council two years ago uh, passed CD61 in 2018 just to allow the site plan to occur so this application can move forward. And as you can see, here, two years later, we're still going through the application. And um, this particular uh, <laughs> property comes down to the alternative compliance where in the staff report and Mr. Burke mentioned it on uh, page 10 it says and if I can read it says while the planning director understands the limitation of the existing condition of the site specifically regarding the frontage along Brandy Round Road the site does not allow for sufficient space to provide an equally effective buffer in terms of the ability to fully design criteria so in other words, they say, oh, by the way, uh, if you look at the uh, road or Brandy Line Road and the parking and the front of this building, there is not space to do any kind of buffering. And therefore, since there's not any space to do any buffering, we're going to recommend denial. That seems to me to be contrary to what the whole purpose of the alternative compliance should be. Uh, we had to meet with Deep High early on to talk about the expansion of Brandywine Road, which they indicated would, would never happen. But be that as it may, well, we have given... Mr. Horn, have given Mr. Mr. Horn, I'm going to stop you for a second, and you can come back to that. I'd like to know, um, I, I, I saw that in the staff report, and I see that you can't do, you're, you're unable to do what what is actually required. And that is why I have um, counsel on the phone, I, but you're counsel for the applicant. So, so explain to me why a departure wouldn't have been helpful in this instance. A, de a departure from 
you asking me why the parts well, well, well maybe well maybe mr burke can can mr i'm a, i'm told mr burke yeah tom burke uh, urban design section the departure for from the uh for the from the landscape standards so it'd be so, a departure from standards for landscaping so the, the, the bottom line, I guess, Madam Chairman, is this, uh, you know, originally when we put in the application, it was for uh, the detailed site plan and with reference to the uh, departure, uh, we didn't recognize that we had to have any departure from any of the parking because everybody has been parking in the spaces that are up front. And I, you, I guess the planning board has the, uh, the, the, the exhibit that the applicant has put in we do. showing that the parking spaces that are in there. Well, when, the, when we give, we dedicate Brandywine Road to that site, that takes up the parking spaces that are up front. You're required to have handicapped parking spaces. The only way the property can, have, can be uh, uh, the only location that the handicapped parking can go is in front of the building, which is the main entrance to the uh, hospital. Because as indicated, in the back, it slopes down. So if, if this board requires alternative compliance so that you have to have buffering on uh, the front of the building, you have effectively prevented handicapped parking from occurring on that site and it, that, that doesn't make any sense no mr horn i agree it, mr horn we agree with you i agree well i don't know about we but i agree with you on that that you can't that that's a possibility what i am looking for guidance on from you or from our council or from your experts is a mechanism to get there um and you can't do what you can't do i understand that so um, and I and I'm told that the, uh, that that you know uh, uh, we just heard Mr. Burke say that a departure from the landscape manual might have alleviated this requirement. Well, it it, it may have, but Madam Chair, as I start off with saying, we've been in this for two years. The whole purpose of the council putting forth this legislation two years ago was for this applicant to be able to add this additional use to his house. It's what we thought would be 90 days. Every time something, every time the application comes in, something else comes up, okay. and we can't, we could continue to just continue to amend the application. And and again, when we went and looked and said, okay, uh, you know, how are we going to address this parking issue? We found a way working with DPI to be able to address it. The alternative compliance plan allows for you to come up with something in alternative but it also allows you again the purpose of it to be able to use I, what i believe to be common sense that a, a alternative compliance in this particular case is not necessary it's not effective it won't work so therefore the planning director has the ability in my opinion to be able to say well we we agree that the alternative compliance would be you don't have to do anything, and well, that's all we ask. But what is the standard for a uh, help me out here? Um, what is the standard for the uh, alternative compliance? What's the standard that well, must I be met? I think it it may be staff may be able to tell you better. It may be equal to or better than uh, than what's required. Okay, so so what what you're saying is this having the park. Having this park in there is equal to or better? It is not only is it equal to, it is the only location that handicapped parking can exist on this site. And the handicapped parking is required. And as you would know, you know, if you see the exhibits that we provided, that there's a commercial building that's right next to it. This is not the only site that, that doesn't have uh, 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 bushes or whatever kind of planting in the front. I mean, the residential house next to it has it. And we said to DPI, if Brandywine is ever, and we said to this there, if Brandywine Road is ever extended uh, and taken up that space, then, you know, maybe at that time we'll be able to put some in the middle of the road or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of decorative. Uh, they, you may even have an island in that role at the time in which we in case we can do something but we are unable to do anything on the frontage of this site 
We've done it all around the building, but we cannot do it on Brandywine Road because of the size of this thing. Okay, so and, but and again, I just want to I want to follow you. Mr. Horn, I just want to follow you. So what you're saying, because being unable to do it in and of itself isn't a criteria. It doesn't help. But what does help is if you're saying that keeping the putting the parking there, keeping the parking there w without the buffering is equal to or better than what's required what what's required now in terms of the landscape it's, manual. The, it's superior to in this yeah. particular case. Okay. The handicap parking is essential for this operation. Okay. I mean, it's essential. Thank you. That's the part I wanted to know. I didn't mean to cut you off in the middle of your presentation. I just wanted to get that address. But you can go ahead with your, the rest of your presentation. But, but that, that, that's basically it. I mean, again, I, I, I understand, um, you know, the, the process, and I understand, you know, we've been talking to Sam about this a long time. And we said, look, you know, if you know, this is a situation where, the, you know, if we could find a way to do some buffering or whatever, uh, in the front of the building, we would do it, but there's an open, there's no way to do it uh, because those two handicap spots that we need for that site is right there, is, as you will see uh, on the plan that dimension. So, and I, again, because this building and this use and this setup has been like this since 1955, I don't see any reason why, you know, again, for the alternative compliance that you can say that in this particular case, uh, you know, alternative compliance is not feasible at this location? No, because the test is not whether it's feasible or not. The test is whether it's better than, equal to, or better than. And that's so that's what I'm eliciting from you. Your argument is that this is, the, the handicapped parking is is not only equal to or better than. You're just said, you just said it's superior right. to. And then the other thing that's I have right. a, a question I have for you is, is you mentioned two council bills. One was CB61 2018. What was the other? No, no, that's the one oh, I just, mentioned. I just okay. said it took two years. Oh, two years. Okay, I'm sorry. Years okay. To move forward. And this is, this is, as we talked about the zoning rewrite, there were certain cases, and this is one we used and as an example of, my goodness, you know, you got to look at small cases and matters like this. It, it, it's not meant to go on and on and on uh, for a simple addition to add an operating room, a second operating room to the back of this, uh, of this house. Okay. And, uh, so anyway, that that's for a different story. But as, but Madam Chairman, again, we recommend uh, approval. We agree with what staff has recommended, uh, except for the planning director's recommendation of denial of the alternative compliance. And we just ask that it would be uh, in this particular case, because the handicapped parking is essential, that it would be uh, approved. Okay, and that is why you have for the um, DP, DSP and. Um, DPLS, you, you're, in your revised um, conditions, um, proposed revised conditions, which we will mark as applicant's exhibit number one, um, that is why you've asked for the, the deletion of condition A1B. Is that, is that correct? A1B deleted. No, actually B1B. B1B. Yeah, B1B. B1B, okay. And, and, and one and one and one and then C. The deletion of B one B and then the changing of the word disapproval to approve. Okay. C. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let me see if the board has questions for you, Mr. Horn. Madam Vice Chair. No, thank you. Okay. Th um, uh, Commissioner Washington? Uh, no question. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Horn, for the clarifying comments. Um, I would ask if our council was on, if they would uh, please respond to that and or comment on it. On the equal then, equal to or better and or superior. Mr. Warner? Well, I think our if Mr. Warner is signing on, I think our council can address the legal requirement, whether it amounts to that or not. I think is the board uh, uh, finding, but okay, Mr. Warner, are you okay. on? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Warner or Ms. Borden. Thank you. 
David Warner, Principal Counsel. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, right, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a relatively simple analysis. Uh, the board has uh, three choices. Uh, one, uh, they can approve the DSP with the full uh, buffer requirement uh, in section 4.6 of the landscape manual, which I believe is uh, approximately a 20 foot wide buffer with 80 plants per 100 feet. Um, two, they can approve the alternative compliance uh, requested by the applicant uh, if they determine that the uh, proposed um, alternative compliance is equally effective as normal compliance would be in terms of quality, durability, hardiness, and ability to fulfill the design criteria. That's specifically what your landscape Okay, say, say, it, say those things again, Mr. equally effective in terms of what? So a proposed alternative compliance measure mm -hmm. must be equally effective as normal compliance in terms of quality, durability, hardiness, and ability to fulfill the design criteria in section three. Okay, so does that pertain to landscaping? That's the part I'm not hearing you say. Does that pertain to landscaping or not? Equally? That's how I interpret that okay. because those terms refer to qualities that are found in landscaping. Okay, and, and, and it, it, as found in section three, you said? Exactly. What does section three say? Section three of the landscape manual. And I can go to that if you give me a second. Provide substantial criteria for the nature of the landscaping pieces. Um, included within that are design features or things besides merely what types of plants, but also for taking into account energy conservation, crime prevention, uh, design features associated with residential properties, and it says parking lot design. Oh, okay, so parking lot design is in there. Let me let me just say this for for the moment. Um, so I see we have a dilemma, and I may ask for Mr. Burke to comment on this a little bit more. But we so there is a required finding to approve alternative compliance, and that is that the what is being proposed is equally effective. Equal, equal to right. right. Or, or better in terms of then normal compliance with the landscape manual. And then it refers to section three. Section three includes all that landscaping and, and the design features as just set forth by our legal counsel, principal counsel, Mr. Warner. But it also includes parking standards in there too, right? Did you just say that, Mr. Warner? It does refer to the design features associated with parking lots. Okay. Now, the problem I have is so that it's so legal. You've given us your legal opinion. The decision as to whether we approve the alternative compliance, because Mr. Um, Mr. Warner just gave us. Well, he was about to give us a third choice, I guess. He gave. He said we have three options. He, he went. He, he set forth two. Um, right. The third option would be that the board can also propose alternative criteria other than what the applicant proposed or staff is recommending. Okay, so I don't know what that would be. Somebody, some some other person may have that. But the one thing I, the, what I'm trying to reconcile this with is the fact that this was a non-conforming use. It was, has been in existence. It has been, like a lot of others, it's been in existence since 1955. And um, it is, uh, so it's been a non-conforming use. So what we have is an impossibility and for Mr. Burke my question is I, I heard Mr. Horn say that they keep going round and round and round on this and every time they submit something else in furtherance then it engenders a different a new requirement and it, it just has to stop somewhere. Mr. Burke can you comment on that? 
Madam Chair, before Mr. Burke, can I have, a, I need a clarification from, from our council because what he was saying seems to be different than what Mr. Horn was saying. So could Mr. Can Mr. Warner address, Mr. Horn's position is, well, we gotta do the old compliance because if we're forced to comply with the landscape manual on Brandywine Road, we will not be able to have handicapped parking. And I didn't hear Mr. Warner say that. Or, I don't think I don't think he's the one who can say that. I think I think um, Mr. Burke can say. You're talking about the design, Commissioner Drago. No, I'm talking about um, Mr. Warren made Mr. Warren's court and Mr. Warren. If, correct me if I'm wrong. What he's saying is, if we are forced to comply, then what happens is we cannot have the handicap handicap parking in the front, and that's the justification for the alternative compliance. What I want Mr. Warner, and that's Mr. Horn, is that correct? I don't want to miss it. That, that is correct. The back of the, the house, it slopes down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you, you know, that would, if somebody is in a wheelchair or something like that, it would not be uh, accessible for them to come around to the front of the house. Okay, I, understand. I just want to make sure I got your argument. And I don't think I heard our council say whether or not that is the type of issue that would allow us to say okay mr warren or okay to the applicant he can't say that but yeah, you know, I, I, can clarify, I can clarify please yeah. clarify mr warner okay so in this specific case section 4.6 of the landscape manual mm -hmm. intends specifically because of the nature of this particular road being historic in nature requires a certain amount of buffering to accomplish the purpose of, of ensuring uh, the aesthetics from that roadway in front of buildings such as this. So it has this buffer requirement. Then if it's impractical or impossible for the applicant to meet that buffer requirement, then they are required to propose something that you will find is equally effective. What they have proposed is not to do any buffering along the road. They are proposing to do some landscaping, uh, 16 shrubs and one shade tree on the north and south sides of the property. And you have to find that that is equally effective to what is required from that lot. Now, as uh, Mr. Burke pointed out, they also had the opportunity to seek a departure, and then this, if they got awarded that, these requirements wouldn't apply. So that's, that's their option. So in okay. other words, let me go back to that. In other words, this, this is what you said before, and I know from having served as legal counsel, you, you can recite the law to us, but and whether we deem this to be um, um, equal to or better is a board finding, and that is why you gave us those three options. Is that not correct? Exactly. So, so that part is up to us. But the question, but but the question, and that's why I was asking Mr. Horn these questions regarding um, if they cannot meet this because uh, because it's been a non-conforming use in existence since 1955. Um, and they can't meet that with the parking there, then what is it uh, What is it that they're proposing? They have the handicapped parking there, they've offered some other buffering, and, and if the board has some other ideas about buffering, that's the third choice that Mr. Warner gave us. So we could find that, that, that what, Mr., what, what the applicant proposed in conjunction to whatever we may add to that, that's another option as well. But that finding is up to the board. Right, and I think it's important to note that the objective of the landscaping section 4.6 is to provide this buffering. And so it's important for the board to keep in mind what the objective of the landscape section is for this particular property. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Horn, earlier what, during his presentation, Madam Chair, made what I was I thought might be some proffers with regards to 
some other plantings, maybe in a center. Can, can you repeat those, Mr. Horn? <clears throat> uh, so uh, we had our meeting with DPI uh, to, to talk about, and they, and they worked with DPWT to talk about the fact that we didn't believe we should be able to do any road improvements, which they agreed with because of the, the nature of the application, because it's, you know, it's a, a minor thing. And we were at first there, we shouldn't really even have to dedicate it because none of the other properties next to it have really dedicated. And, uh, and so therefore, you're not going to ever, uh, you know, widen this road. But they, they, they took the position and said, well, no, we need to, Brandywine Road may eventually be widened, even though it's a historic road, et cetera, et cetera. So we agreed to dedicate. So what I was saying is when they widen the road and it becomes more than a two-lane road, they may have an island or something in the middle, in which case, you know, we may be able to put some plantings in that island or something along those lines that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that wouldn't be the front of our building, but it would be a, an option uh, if, they ever, if they ever would do something like that. Uh, because as you, if you will see from the uh, exhibits that we put, the, the, uh, the building, I mean, we, we show both the aerials and uh, the, the uh, uh, site from Brandywine Road. You can just see it's all uh, pervious, uh, that pervious surface is all paved now. And there's just nothing, there's nothing that can be done. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington, did I ask you already? Yes. Questions? Well, I think my question started this last conversation, so I'm fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Dorner? I'm fine, thank you. Um, Madam Vice Chair, I think I, I asked you already. Okay. So let me say, let me, let me, um, while we're thinking, let me turn to um, um, Ms. Uh, Mary Force Tucker, please. Uh, okay, I'll go forth. Uh, my name is Mary Force Tucker. Uh, I live at 11804 Mary Catherine Drive, Hunton, Maryland, 207 I'm a cat person. Dr. DeBretian has been my cat veterinarian, and Clinton Veterinary Hospital has been my animal hospital since about 2004-2005. I guess I should ask, are you hearing me okay? We hear you great. Just All great. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Anyway, I've always received excellent care there. The hospital itself is very small for surgery and various tests. Animals have to be taken downstairs to the lower level, what I call a basement. Uh, Dr. DeBrestian and staff are always going up and down stairs. The staff carrying the animals needing surgery or tests, and Dr. DeBrestian doing the surgery or test. Having all of this on one level would make it so much easier on everyone. I'm in total support of the addition. It's long overdue. That's what I have to say. Hope you approve it. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Ms. Forge Tucker. Are there any questions? And uh, does the board have any questions of Ms. Forge Tucker? If so, please so indicate. Okay. Thank you. Um, that concluded my sign-up list for this case. There was no one else here to speak. So now, let me turn back to Mr. Burke to see if you have anything that you care to add. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, Tom Burke from the Urban Design Section. I just want to do uh, to clean up a few of the, uh, the talking points. First of all, echoing um, what Mr. Warner said uh, regarding the intent of the landscape manual and the uh, intent of all, uh, alternative compliance. Um, we, we, we view uh, alternative compliance as equal to or better than normal compliance with the landscape manual. Um, to, uh, to respond to the uh, timelines of this project, the, uh, an informational mailing for the project was sent out in December of 2018, and the project was accept, uh, accepted on December of 2019. And that was uh, largely due to discussions regarding the, uh, the parking in the rear 
and the fact that it it was uh, it was not a permitted uh, uh, addition to the to the property. Um, and then lastly, uh, regarding the dedication, um, the dedication is being required as uh, with that, dedications are required along this road with applications. Um, and dedications, the, the, let's put the dedication, them. Dedications of roadway. Yeah. Um, the fact that they haven't been dedicated on either side is, or, or along that stretch is, is simply to the fact that there haven't been applications in for review. But once uh, they but then, once they come in that the then the dedication then they must dedicate. Yeah, and of course that's uh, that's uh, DeFi's right. area of expertise, but uh, that's that's uh, our understanding is that when applications are brought in along roads uh, along this roadway particularly, then uh, dedications are then required at that time. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the regarding the, the plantings off site, uh, we can't. We can't accept or control any kind of plantings that might occur off site. There is no design plan in for Brandywine Road, to my knowledge. So we don't know that there would be an island that would that would serve as uh, as a planting area um, and and uh, and satisfy any kind of proper for future plantings. Uh, and that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burt. Mr. Horn. Anything else in response? You get to close it out. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I just, uh, I just hope that we, you know, that um, no matter whether we talk about the zoning ordinance or any law, period, the common sense is not uh, shuttered. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there is no way that the uh, landscape manual was intended to rec make a requirement uh, of such that. If it was granted, it would block access to the driveway. There's no way that that was the intent of the zoning ordinance or the landscape manual. In this particular case, as we mentioned, that all, every place that we're able to provide the additional buffering and stuff, we've done it. The only area we cannot do it, if the possibility to do it, is off of Brandywine Road. And uh, our the parking, as it stands now, is uh, head in, but we are changing the design of the parking line, which is part of the alternative compliance, to uh, side by side two, uh, uh, well, the two handicapped parking spaces. They're not straight in; they're two sides. You see, in the in the, uh, in the um, plan that's submitted that. Uh, and again, because of the topography of the place, this is the only place that anybody who is handicapped can park and get access to that building. And so, therefore, you know, uh, uh, you know, it it it, it puzzles me when it, when the planning director says right in there that we recognize that the site does not allow for sufficient space to provide for an equally effective. Buffer, and then to try to go ahead and make it fit anyway. In this particular case, the best alternative compliance is no compliance or compliance with the parking for the handicap, which is absolutely required. Mr. Horn, are you saying, are you, translation, are you basically saying this comes down to the landscape manual versus um, compliance with the ADA? Well, it, it, it does to me because that's the only, we wouldn't be able to uh, have the handicap uh, park in any other place. And, and the landscape manual is not the intent. And I, I, you know, I agree that uh, with, with your counsel and even Mr. Burke said you have to look at what the intent of, but the intent of the landscape manual is not to support the ability for the property to be developed. And, uh, and without the handicapped parking spaces uh, at that location, at the level of the top of the building, in front of the building, then uh, we would not be able to have any handicapped parking. And that, and, and again, that building, as Ms. Uh, Fourth Turker has said, has been that way 
finding um i think you'd have to say i think i'm looking at page 10. Well, hold on with too many people turn your mics off uh, page 10 um i'm looking at the planning director's um comments that um that it's not possible um to provide the buffer there so then what do you do so i, I just i don't know what you do um madam uh, chair yes uh, this is Andre Checkley, planning director. Director, thank you. We're we're not talking about um, whether or not this project can go forward, and we're not talking about common sense versus the ordinance. We're talking about process, and the landscape manual defines a specific process. You can deviate from the landscape manual if you can provide equivalent or better results. Right. If you cannot, the ordinance provides an alternative process, which all of the issues that Mr. Horn has stated, it being near since 1950-something, no place else to put the handicap parking, all of those issues would come into play in the departure request. This is simply not the appropriate process. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so somebody else was getting ready to say something? Uh, does the board have any other questions? Mr. Horn, in response? Uh, I, I would say again, Madam Chairman, it's clear that the alternative compliance, uh, understand the landscape manual, that it does not uh, anticipate you create an impossibility you have the, just like the planning director had the ability to approve this. She recommended disapproval. The board has uh, the ability to recommend approval based on the situation we have currently. And I, I would I would ask the board to take that in consideration and to approve this CSP, uh, DPLS, and alternative compliance so that Dr. DeBrecia can move forward with this, with this process that's been going on for over two years. Thank you. Let me see if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Commissioner Washington? No, I have no questions. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? No, no. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? No questions. Okay, then is there a motion? Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington. Um, I'd like to make a motion, uh, but before so doing, let me just say, uh, and, and this is specifically with regards to this conversation we're having around the alternative compliance. Uh, what seems to be painfully clear to me is that we all agree what needs to happen um, and, and I am certainly not a fan of process getting in the way of the right thing taking place. Uh, and if I, if, I, if I understand it correctly, um, you know, from the applicant's perspective, you know, why, why would one pursue a departure? It's almost um, kind of a double negative. Why pursue a departure when, uh, you know, all it is is just a paper, a paper kind of process, literally just a process, because you can't be in non-compliance with ADA 
uh, you know, in, in order to pursue an alternative compliance. So, and then I do understand what our planning director says is, well, we'll probably, we will, we would probably get to where you want to be, but just go through this extra process in order to get there. So with that, Madam Chair, um, I move that we adopt the findings of staff with the exception of the finding related to disapproval of AC 2000, uh, two, 20002, specifically related to 4.6, and approved DPLS-468 uh, DPS, I'm sorry, DSP-1803, and AC-2002, uh, related to section 4.7 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and with the conditions uh, being further amended by applicant exhibit number one. And I would also move approval of AC-20002 specifically related to section 4.6 and would ask staff um, to, to uh, especially take note of the discussion around uh, the landscape manual in section 4.6 um, and ensure that the resolution repl uh, reflects an appropriate finding incorporating uh, equal to or better uh, and quite frankly superior um, and I think some language in there with regards to just the direct conflict with ADA compliance as opposed or not well I guess it would be ADA compliance um, as opposed to landscape requirements, because I just don't know. And for me, it does come down to common sense. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know who, within the sound of my voice, quite frankly, would disagree that, you know, you, we cannot have ADA compliance just to ensure that we've got appropriate landscaping. Um, and also would incorporate the comments made by our attorney uh, Mr. Warner, and especially uh, uh, language to include the reference to section three of the landscape manual, which which not in implicitly but explicitly discusses parking lot designs um, as one of the filters and criteria uh, re related to how we might think about um, 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 alternative compliance. Pretty long motion, but I wanted to make sure that at least all those were incorporated, so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bailey. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Washington, a second by Vice Chair Bailey. Is there additional discussion? I have a yeah. question. Okay, okay. This is Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, Mr. Horn made what I consider to be uh, Offers. Another area where he could perhaps, if they do rebuild the uh, Brandywine Road, that they would be willing to put some shrubbery or trees in any center islands. In the median, yeah, he did say that. Are you saying if, if it comes to that? There's a proper. And you said if it comes to that, you would like to add that? If that? I would, yes. Does the. Would not incorporate into a motion because it's almost like you're proffering something you can't even forget. But I mean, I'm comfortable with it if, if my colleague would like to see it in there. So, <laughs> well, you could put this should the, should the widening of the of, of Brandy Ride Road allow it in the future, accommodate it in the yeah, future. You could that's put what that. I'm saying, I mean, yeah, I'm fine with some language. Okay, we have a motion. And it's, so the wait a minute. Does the seconder accept that? Well, yes. I, I don't think it's actually. Well, yes. Okay. So we have a mo. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. That was a question raised, and, and so so now it's an amended motion and second. Um, is there additional discussion? Yeah, just one, one, a couple other points, Madam Chair. So I think sure. Commissioner Washington pointed out very sagely sort of the, the conundrum that we're up against. And it, my guess is the applicant kind of went through this process trying to get some simple kind of things done and didn't anticipate all these roadblocks kind of coming up. And hopefully the zoning rewrite will remove some of these. We have 
old properties that, that just aren't feasible from a financial sense to raise and rebuild, we're going to come up with these kinds of issues that are difficult to resolve because we've tried to write a simple rule or some manuals around everything in the whole county. I think it's, it's fairly reasonable what the applicant is asking for. How we do it may be a different sort of opinion. Um, but from what I've heard today, it seems like this is sort of a superior option that we do have in terms of the quantity and, and quality, there are, there are more plants than what would have been there under the, um, the other sort of requirements um, it, and by us approving the, the alternative compliance. It seems like they're, they're definitely going to be more hardy and they're going to have a better ability to fulfill the, not necessarily the written um, extent of the manual, but the intent um, is what my guess would be. So I, I think from that standpoint, we've exceeded what our council has suggested is is the interpretation or the, the requirements um, to allow the approval of this uh, of the AC that, that's in this motion. Thank you. Um, also on the discussion, Madam, I would... I would Madam Chair. Yes? Um, I do want to go back for a comment regarding okay. the, the motion. Uh, I don't think I've read the phrase common sense any place in any of our manuals or any of our, uh, the information that we get. But at some point, I think we do have to use that uh, and determine whether or not it's equal or better. And right. given the situation as it is, I, I absolutely think it is equal or better. And that it gives us an opportunity to uh, support a business, an, an, enti an entity that's been in the county for over 50 years. Uh, it would be Six, different 65. if it was new and something that was just beginning. I think that would make a big difference, but I, that's not the case now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to associate myself with the comments made by each of our planning board members in this particular case. Um, we do have to utilize common sense, and yet we do have to comply with the law. So we can't, one can't run afoul of the other. Um, or, or, so in this particular case, um, as Commissioner Washington set forth in her motion, she basically already outlined the finding that was required in order for us to go forward with this alternative compliance. And so I want to make sure that that is, in fact, um, included in the uh, in the uh, resolution and, and that we can tighten it up, but she has already stated it. And furthermore, from a legal standpoint, if those are the only places where you can have handicapped parking and handicapped parking is a necessity, then that is an ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act requirement, which is a national federal law that must supersede the, the landscape manual, which is local. So um, I would associate myself with those comments. Um, all in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. Ma uh, Madam Vice Chair. Aye. Wait a minute, I'm calling roll. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> Aye. Okay, Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Um, the ayes have it five zero. Now wait a minute. Was that that is for the? We need two separate motions on this one, right? Is this right or no? No, it's a companion. Yes, it's combined. Case. Okay, it's combined. Okay. Um. Okay, yes, thank you. It's, it's, it's the next one that's two. Okay, got it. Okay, um, the ayes have this thank unanimous. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. thank you. Now we are now about to go. Every, is everybody okay, or, or do we need a, a health break at all before we go to the next one? We're good? Okay, so we're going to... Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you can't ahead. I'll step away for two minutes. I'm fine. Okay, the, well, okay, but well, before I would like no. everyone here, so let's take the two minutes. Yeah. Let's take the two minutes and then come back and do um, fairways because fairways is going to take some time. Thank you, Madam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's just take five minutes, okay? Thank you. Camera's on. Okay. The Prince George's County Planning Board is back in session. For purposes of the public, I have to do a roll call again. Madam Vice Chair? Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? Present. Okay. Commissioner Dwarner? Yes, here. Commissioner Geraldo? I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So before we go forward with um, preliminary plan um, 4-19005, 
the fairways at Glendale Estates. I'm going to do a roll call to make sure that we have the requisite folks. Um, we have Sherry Connor, who is present today. Okay, uh, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Rivera, you have to unmute, unmute your mic. I thought I did. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Yes, you're present. Okay. 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 Sean, I'll go back and mute. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, Sean Bruce. Here. Glenn Burton. I'm here. Okay. Um, uh, Megan Reiser. I'm here. Okay, Daniel, um, I can't pronounce it. Shogel? Shogel? Schlegel. Schlegel, I knew that. Schlegel. Daniel Schlegel? Ryan McAllister? Yes, ma'am, President. Here. Uh, okay, thank you. Mike Lenhart? Uh, good afternoon, I'm here. Okay, Mirabel Asengong? I probably didn't, I probably mispronounced it. Can you correct the pronunciation for me again, please? Asungong. Asungong, okay, thank you. Um, Thomas Dartery? I'm here. Thank you. Um, okay, so, and that concludes my sign up list. And then we will note that we have um, two exhibits. We have the applicant's proposed, re proposed revision to the conditions, and then we have the letter from the Maryland Department of Transportation to Mike Lenhart. Okay. Um, all right, Ms. Connor. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, this is Sherry Connor with the subdivision and zoning section. Before you is the preliminary plan of subdivision for the fairways 4 19005, which was previously scheduled as item 10 for the March 19th planning board agenda. Uh, thank you for introducing the exhibits. Um, staff had also received, received an additional exhibit, uh, which consisted of a 22-slide PowerPoint. It contains photographs and exhibits um, that the applicant may use during their presentation. Um, it was entered into the record, uh, received before noon yesterday, and is available um, online for public viewing. Uh, the, the applicant's revisions to conditions were also added online for public viewing and these will be discussed further in the presentation. The subject property uh, is the site of the former Glendale Golf Course, which is proposed to be subdivided into 272 lots and 15 parcels for the development of 210 single-family detached and 62 single-family attached dwellings. Next slide, please. The site is located in, in the northern area of Prince George's County within Planning Area 70 and Council District 4. Next slide, please. More specifically, the site is located on the east side of Prospect Hill Road, approximately 1,600 feet north of its intersection with Glendale Boulevard. Old Prospect Hill Road abuts the site along its western boundary, and Hillmead Road abuts the site, uh, part of the site to the east. Next slide, please. The subject property is located in the OS and R18C zones bounded to the north and east by properties in the RA, RE, and RR zones, and to the south and west by properties in the R18C, OS, and RR zones. Next slide, please. The aerial photo shows the site is currently developed as a golf course with intermittent woodland and several buildings, including a historic dwelling located central to the site. Surrounding the properties, the, the surrounding properties are primarily developed with single-family detached dwellings. Next slide, please. The site uh, map shows varied topography, areas of steep slopes, and existing irrigation ponds on the subject site. Next slide, please. The master plan right-of-way map shows Glendale Boulevard, an arterial right-of-way to the southwest of the site. Prospect Hill Road, a collector roadway to the west, and Hillmead Road, a collector roadway to the east of the site. Next slide, please. The critical intersections identified in this slide and as further detailed in the staff report on page eight 
uh, were analyzed and will operate at adequate levels of service with recommended improvements at the intersection of Glendale Boulevard and Lamb Severn Road. The Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration letter uh, was submitted to the chairman's office and will be incorporated into the record, uh, concurs with the findings of the transportation analysis. Next slide, please. The preliminary plan of subdivision provides the proposed lot layout and internal street circulation pattern. The townhouse lots are located within the northwest portion of the site. And access to the development is shown from Hillmead Road and Prospect Hill Road. It's noted that there's an existing <coughs> site access from Old Prospect Hill Road, which is to be temporarily used and later converted to emergency only access once the new access locations are constructed. Adequate public facilities, including fire, rescue, police, water, and sewer facilities, are available to serve the subject site. Next slide, please. The NRI uh, plan for the property uh, was reviewed during the preliminary plan and uh, of subdivision, and during that review, field visits were conducted by Maryland Department of the Environment as well as planning staff. At this field visit, it was determined that three of the streams shown on the approved NRI are now considered ephemeral and are no longer considered regulated features. The applicant submitted an NRI exhibit shown here um, showing the necessary modifications. The NRI exhibit shows the site having 242 on-site specimen trees, as well as various stream and wetlands. <coughs> Revision and approval of the NRI are recommended prior to signature approval of the preliminary plan of subdivision. Next slide, please. The tree conservation plan provided by the applicant proposes the removal of 186 of the on-site specimen trees in order to develop the site. A variance request was submitted and staff recommends the approval of the removal of 179 specimen trees as outlined in the staff report on pages 22 to 24. Woodland reforestation, conservation, and landscape areas are shown in gray on the TCP1. Next slide, please. The PMA impacts, uh, primary management area impacts to the regulated environmental features are shown on this slide. Lots are not proposed in these areas. However, the impacts are necessary to support infrastructure for the site. The staff is recommending approval of these impacts as outlined further on pages 25 through 27 of the staff report. Next slide, please. The applicant has provided a site rendering which better depicts the lot layout, circulation, historic site, and open space areas. Staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve preliminary plan of subdivision 4-19005 TCP1-016-2019 and variance from section 25122B1G for the removal of 179 specimen trees subject to the 23 conditions contained in the staff report. Staff is in agreement with the conditions uh, revisions proposed by the applicant, which were submitted into the record and referenced earlier in this presentation. And this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Ms. Connor. Um, let me see if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Washington? I don't have any questions, uh, but I would just ask when the applicant uh, begins his uh, testimony, I know that there are no, well, I see a few strikes and additions to some of the conditions. If he could just kind of uh, orient us into uh, his proposed revisions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dwarner? No, no. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Madam Chair, no questions at this time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Mr. Rivera, uh, Mr. Rivera, and to everyone on this case. I am uh, um, giving fair um, notice that um, at 2 o'clock we're going to stop for a lunch break. And, and also, as I said that in the beginning as well, we're going to stop for a lunch break, which would probably only be maybe a half an hour, so aiming to resume at 2.30, which there, give or take a minute or two. Um, and that will allow us to switch the technical hearing writers for the respect for the next um, group of cases as well. 
or to finish this one. Um, Mr. Rivera. Here I am. Yep, there you are. Okay. Great. There's two mute buttons on our system here. So I forgot which one it was. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. In the times of uh, stress. But I, as uh, Matt said earlier and Arthur, you guys have done a yeoman's job of keeping uh, trudging through this situation. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the record. Yeah, I'll address for the record. Conditions. Yes, for the record. You should get an APA award. You might be the only planning group that had any meetings. Okay. Uh, just quickly. For the well, record, you're Norman Rivera. Okay. Excuse me? Oh, Norman Rivera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, forgot about the normal budget. <laughs> Norman Thank Rivera, attorney for the applicant offices in Bowie, Maryland. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I'm not used to ha not having the podium in front of me. That's okay. Um, uh, as Ms. Connor went through the stack report, she really hit all the highlights. Uh, just a bit of background. Uh, everybody knows that the golf business in the county and probably countrywide has been diminishing, unfortunately. Uh, in this case, Glendale Golf Course, which was here since the late 50s, suffered the same fate. Uh, we purchased the golf course last September. And during that time period, Councilman Turner processed, processed the uh, sector plan amendment for the East Glendale area to effectuate the plans we have today, which allows to develop the property at RR densities, which is what's proposed. Uh, the uh, process had plenty of notice to the communities being a sector plan. Uh, Park and planning itself had sent out notices to each homeowner the affected municipalities like Bowie, et cetera, Glendale Citizens Association. John Shields, during that same time period before, when he was looking for possible purchasers, had several meetings at the course with different people uh, and the citizens. And then as we took over, we had various meetings with people who live around the site. Ms. Maribel is on the phone as well. And we've continued that, that dialogue. So. We sent them notices of the various hearings and the continuances, uh, the staff report, and the revisions. Um, with that, the conditions that we worked on with Ms. Connor and her group, especially environmental planning, who met with us on the site a couple times, uh, we are now in full agreement with those conditions. Uh, we don't have any other uh, preface remarks or anything to say about the staff report. This is a preliminary plan followed by a detailed site plan, plat, and permit. So in the prelim, there's a TCP-1, for example, and an NRI that gets refined with the DSP, plat, and permits later. So we will continue to refine the plan to deal with the environmental features and any other uh, issues as we proceed, and then you'll see the architecture at the next level with the DSP. Um, with that, that really concludes our presentation. If you have any other questions, I can go right to the uh, conditions if you wish. Why don't you just go forward with those um, pursuant to Commissioner Washington's question, and then we'll see if okay. there are any other questions. Okay. Thank you. I believe it's called additional backup for supplemental item 10 in your backup. Right. Yes. And at the very bottom of the first page is the first change to condition 13G. And the change is an addition of the phrase, this may be further evaluated at the time of DSP. So this allows for landscape credits for certain areas to be determined further at DSP, which it does in any event, but it's good that it, it, this language is in the um, resolution and the report. Okay, just let me stop you for a second because I just want to make sure everyone knows this was posted online and right, and you're talking only about two, as far as I can see, well, three um, 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 changes, okay? So right now you just did 13G, which was just add, adding, yeah, yeah. this may be further evaluated at the time of detail site plan. Okay, next would be H, go ahead. Yes, Madam Chair, thank same you. Thing. This is the same change to that as the same phrase. This may be further evaluated at the time of the ESP period. 
And then number 15? That, and then 15 clarifies the process of revising the natural resources inventory. So now the language should read, the natural resources inventory, NRI, shall be filed to be revised through the standard review and approval process, period. This deleted the word approved, revision of the NRI, this is the new language, shall be approved prior to detailed site plan review and approval, period. Thank so that you. clarifies that we submit one and it gets reviewed and approved concurrent with the DSP and the staff and I would agree to that. Okay, thank you. And let me hear, I know you said this earlier, but Ms. Connor? The staff is in agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else, Mr. Rivera, at this time? No, ma'am, thank you. Okay, um, let me see if the board has any questions of you, Madam Vice Chair. No, no questions at this time. Commissioner Washington? I have no questions, and thank you for the clarification, Mr. Rivera. Okay, um, Commissioner Gerardo? No questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner um, Dorner? No questions, and I thank Mr. Rivera for his earlier comment. I think it is pretty commendable that we got everything up and going so quickly, and that everyone worked together to get all the cases to get uh, going today and, and streaming this is this has been very seamless thank you yeah um so mr rivera you have um some engineers there with you do you and, and mr linhart the traffic engineer do you need to put them on or are you good for now they're all okay we're all in the same room okay six feet apart six feet apart okay <laughs> okay um okay mirabel asanang here Hi, do you wish to speak? Yes, I do. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, for instance, the new uh, staff report, they did report that our school cannot handle the new influx because they are above 100% all uh, elementary, middle, and high school. And yet they are still, I didn't see any um, comments on that, they didn't say anything on that, and um, well, also, uh -huh. in, uh -huh. no, go ahead, I'll let you finish first. Yeah, in 2003, a very similar proposal was proposed, which was actually uh, plan 4.03088, and that was abandoned because um, even though Again, staff report stated that it kind of met uh, adequate public facilities. The county, especially the city of Bowie, actually declined to have this because everybody was in agreement that the state um, standards are really set low. And it's not because um, them passing doesn't mean they really pass. It, it just means that our standards are set very low. And then now again, we have a very similar proposal, and the state is trying to pass it without addressing the concerns that had been before to name the road because Protect Hill just can't handle this traffic anymore, regardless of what the staff report says. And that is because they're using data from 2000, uh, from 10 years ago. Uh, we had to push forward and Fight for them to include to them for them to include data for for the new data for schools. So it's like we are using old data to approve things that are now. Um, we as and many people in the community, we would like for we're trying to get this resolved from the legislative perspective. So we're hoping that we will have uh time to have this review because um we're pushing for something that our facilities cannot handle we are already having a lot of crime in the facility, uh, this way and that is not addressed there's not um uh, no new uh plan for any new police station no new plan for any fire station which were all the things that were cited during the plan for that zero three zero zero eight eight and then social deal is an amalgam of potholes Nobody is mentioning any new construction of a road, and yet most of the traffic for this development is going to come through Prospect Hill Road. The staff report used um, data for traffic, and they did a Monday to Friday. We have a greater influx on Sunday and some Saturdays when we have uh, we have a uh, a mega church.
that bring thousands, they hold four services, and they bring thousands of the prospect here road. So the staff report does not take that into consideration. So we, the people of Glendale, and they keep citing uh, Glendale Citizen Association, which does not represent the people, but Glendale Citizen Association has also said they did not put out a statement. They have not put it in agreement or in denial of this. So we cannot keep using Glendale Citizen Association as a representation of what the people want. Okay. Um, so um, I don't know. Uh, everything that is being spoken of is about what is going to lead to this day. Uh, it's like they're, pushing, uh, they're already pushing forward to approving this without really seeing what the people are saying because every time the citizens have written to the county executives, everything we're right here, they're trying to justify the process as to how they resolve the golf course using a minor amendment, which should not have been done in any, anyway. And they keep saying that the, uh, the, the required notifications and all that. And every time they keep saying it again, they will say mention the end of the uh, citizen association. But the end of citizen association actually never endorsed that project. Um, they were, the, the, uh, the, all the support that came for the rezoning came from the church. And that was because they wanted to have their uh, old, uh, the senior citizen community belt. So it was not about giving support to this new uh, construction. So we as the people, we, we are not against um, uh, construction, we're not against development, but we are advocating for, um, for more um, oversight, not, not really oversight, we are um, advocating for more um, smart development. In, and in so saying, so we need, um, as we, we are trying to go through this the legal way now because it's like they're just pushing for things and we need time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Asunga. Um, we appreciate that, and I'm going to um, I'm going to go on to our next speaker first, and then try to address some of these your questions, okay? Your comments, okay? Okay. Um, and then right. and then we can address them all. Um, Mr. Darty. Oh yeah, I'm here. Okay. Well, you stole my thunder. Wow, that's exactly what I was going to cover a lot of it. Now the thing is with the, with the with the schools, it's a real concern. Um, they're all over. You know, we have a lady that represents Glendale Elementary School that comes to our Glendale Civic Association, and the numbers she is saying, and the numbers that the county are saying, are two different things. She's saying there that the schools uh, right now enrolled at 155 percent, and they're expecting 60 more kids in there because they're starting a a program for autistic children. I think that's what she said the last time. So and, and looking at the at the sector plan for from the 2006 East Glendale sector plan, you know one of the policies on the visions of public facilities it says construct the appropriate number of schools to achieve a school system that operates at 100 percent capacity or below in every school, and that has not been achieved. If you look at the boundaries of the schools, okay, um, the fair the fair wood, Mr. Mr. Uh, Darty, Mr. Darty. I'm going. Can I? I'm going to come yeah. back to the schools for a second. Can I have you go on to your next um, topic? And the, the reason, and then I'll explain that. So, can I go? Have you go on to the next topic after schools? Uh, okay. Uh, again, we go back to the sector plan. The sector plan talked about, and this is back in 2006 when we only thought we were going to have 207 homes on the golf course, and then they changed it to a adult living community, and there were going to be 390 apartments on each corner of the golf course, and they made recommendations that needed to be, be provided to, um, to, to um, make it a more livable community. One of the things was to put a police station right next to the uh, fire department. That hasn't achieved, that hasn't occurred. Um, the Prospect Hill Road, they recommended improvements to the Prospect Hill Road that's never been up to date according to the Secretary plan. But um, everything that Millie says, you know, Millie and I have talked a lot, and uh, she represented uh, my, my view as well. Thanks, Millie. Um, thank you, Mr. Doherty. Okay, I'm going to get some of your, your joint questions addressed, okay? 
So I'm going to start okay. by saying I wanted to point out, and I may have, I'm going to have Mr. Lenhart address the, and then followed by Mr. Burton address the transportation issues. Um, it's, it's, a lot of it is set forth in the staff report, but I'm going to have you address them. Um, I'm going to have um, legal counsel or, or perhaps um, um, Ms. Connor also address the situation with the schools because I have to tell you that this board does not make the laws, but we must follow these laws that have been enacted by our legislative bodies. One law um, has one law has removed the school's analysis from um, um, from the APF adequate public facilities analysis at the time of, of preliminary plan of subdivision. So we can no longer consider the um, how crowded the schools are or how crowded they are not in making a decision on a preliminary plan of subdivision because they now pay an impact fee, a school impact fee. So I can have Mr. Um, if, if Mr. Warner, if you want to address, or, or Ms. Connor. Mr. Warner, you want to go forward? But So that, that's something that we're precluded from considering at this point, and that is the only reason I stopped you on that one, Mr. Doherty, because um, the law has changed on that, and that's not a factor we can consider. Mr. Warner? Yeah, uh, yes, that's that's correct. David Warner, principal counsel. Uh, we do not determine the capacity of school buildings, for example. Uh, we determine the number of kids that will be generated by a project. And what happens after that? Um, there's a fee that they will have to pay per unit. Right, and we do not set that fee. That's set by the county and collected by the county. So, so pursuant to. Um, section the subtitle 24 of the subdivision regulations we analyze school facilities um, for purposes of analysis but we cannot use that to approve or disapprove a preliminary plan of subdivision miss connor do you care to add to that um that that is accurate thank you madam chair um specifically section uh 10 192.01 uh, of of the uh, county code requires that fee amount be paid at the time of permitting for each building permit um, for each dwelling unit and it is payable to the county um, and there is no other mitigation required for schools the um, tables provided uh, in the staff report are for informational purposes um, and and outline the analysis that was conducted based on figures obtained from public schools and in accordance with our public facilities um, master plan. So that is the reason we can't um, address the issue of schools, but there is an impact fee that must be paid um, pursuant to um, county law. Um, so thank you. Now with regard to the transportation analysis, um, Mr. Lenhart, can you start, can you address the transportation analysis? And what one of the things that Ms. Um, Asagong said was all the, all the tests were so long ago, and furthermore, that the tests were done Monday through Friday, not taking into consideration the services that are conducted at Reed Temple, which is at the intersection of Prospect Hill Road and 193, um, which I, I was here when we approved Reed Temple and um, was a little bit nervous about that. I must say they do a yeoman's job with their, they have um, police there um, enforcing um, ingress and egress there. But, um, but I think what she's talking about is the combination of, with the church and then the traffic generated by um, the proposed development. And if you could address that, Mr. Lenhart. Certainly, uh, it's Mike Lenhart with Lenhart Traffic Consulting. Uh, we did um, conduct a new traffic impact study that starts with a scoping agreement that we prepare and submit to park and planning uh, transportation staff for their review and approval. That was approved and establishes the intersections we need to study, um, the, uh, the parameters including trip assignments for the site and various things that go into the uh, of the traffic study. We did conduct new traffic counts in March of 2019 at all the study intersections. Uh, the guidelines for traffic impact studies require that the traffic counts be done on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday when school's in session. Uh, we understand that the megachurches have their 
own type of traffic patterns um, and, and own challenges. Uh, but the guidelines do require us to do our accounts on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday when school's in session. Uh, that generally accounts for uh, the peak traffic flows for the traffic on the roadways. It includes commuter traffic, school traffic. <clears throat> And um, we studied all the intersections. Everything was found to pass. We did look at Prospect Hill Road at the site access. We looked in both directions on Prospect Hill down to Route 450 and up to um, uh, Fletcher and on um, at Prospect uh, Hill. Um, and Hill I'm Mead. sorry, and on Hill Mead. Hill we Mead. looked on Hill Mead as well uh, from the site access down to Route 450 and Prospect Hill. Uh, out to 193. Um, all of the intersections passed except for the intersection, um, intersection one that's shown on that exhibit at Route 193 and 564 uh, was found to be exceeding the threshold, uh, which is a level of service D is acceptable. Uh, succeeding that, we identified left turn lanes to be constructed on northbound and southbound 564 that would um, create uh, acceptable levels of service at that intersection. Uh, and we actually are currently working on design of those improvements now. Uh, State Highway has reviewed and approved our traffic study, including all of the traffic counts and components. Uh, transportation staff, park and planning as well, has reviewed and approved the study uh, in their staff report. Um, Mr. Lenhart, let me let me make sure I heard you, but I want to um, um, repeat that. So I'm looking at the letter from dated October 21st, 2019, from the Maryland Department of Transportation, addressed to you, and it does talk about the various intersections. It accepts your study, accepts um, um, pretty much everything that you've submitted in terms of the traffic analysis, and what you what I did hear you say is that. Um, that at the intersection of 564, which is Lanham 7 Road, and 193, um, um, specifically on Lanham, 7, on, on Lanham 7 Road, going in both directions on 193, there will, instead of being a single left turn lane, there will be, a single lane, there will be um, a double turn, turning lane. Is that That's right? Correct. Okay. So yes, that, is, correct. that is what the applicant is required to do in order to address um, the, the, the traffic generated by this proposed subdivision, because that's the only failing intersection in accordance with the gui um, guidelines for the analysis of tr um, transportation. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Burton, do you have anything else to add? Madam Chair, for the record, Glenn Burton with the transportation section, I, I fully concur with the comments made by Mr. Lenhart. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. And so, and so that also addresses um, Ms. Asanang's um, Gong's, uh, issue about why the analysis is done during the weekdays, because it has to be done during the, the, the days when most people are working and also where, where, where school is in session. And, and, um, and so it does not take into account Sundays. Is, is, that, what, is that pretty accurate? That's correct. It does not include Sunday traffic counts. Okay. When when people so so what it does is it, it analyzes the intersections in the morning with rush hour and the evening rush hour, which is called the AM and PM peak hours. And um, on Sundays, it's it's not the same for everybody. It's, people aren't rushing out the door pretty much the same in that same concentrated time period in the morning and in the evening, or rushing home at the same time in the evening. So that is one of the reasons that the transportation got, uh, analysis is not performed on Sundays. I do understand Reed Temple. I see the traffic going in and out of uh, there. Um, but I think with their continued um, police presence and traffic um, uh, mitigation uh, measures, um, that's probably um, um, doable. Um, but I, but Ms. Asagong and Ms. Doherty, I can only we can only address what we are legally able to address. So they have addressed the roads in accordance with the guidelines and the schools have been removed from the equation in terms of the analysis at the preliminary plan of subdivision stage. So I just needed to say that. Um, let me see if the board has any questions of anyone who has spoken thus far. 
Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Um, Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Madam Chair, I have no questions at this time. Commissioner Dorner? No. Okay. Um, so let me see. Um, Ms. Mr. Um, Rivera, let's go back to you for a second. Or Ms. Connor. Mr. Yeah. Rivera, no, Ms. Connor, do you have anything else to add? No, Madam Chair. Ms. Mr. Rivera? Nothing to add, thank you. Um, I, I hope that in this, we're, I'm going to entertain a motion shortly, and I hope that you will um, um, continue to work with the community. And it, it do, as Ms. Asangong said, it does go beyond the Glendale Citizens Association, although we know they are very, they're a very engaged citizens association. And the law requires us to provide notice and for the applicants to provide um, notice and information um, to the citizens, all regist registered uh, citizens associations and homeowners associations prior to the filing and that is why the citizens association has come up but it's not to the exclusion of other citizens in the area. So we thank you for taking the time, Ms. Asengai and Ms. Mr. Gardy, I, we thank you for taking the time to participate and Mr. Rivera, depending on how this, this motion goes, I would ask that you continue to work with them and um, in the community. Okay? Uh, I, have, I have a question. Wait, I Ms. Asagang? Yes, I still have a question. So, um, going by the law, since we're going by the law now, um, the sector plan is supposed to be for the development to be in um, conformity with what is existing on the land. And right now, we do not have anything other than RR around here. As stated earlier, they're all residential. But now, we're going to have town homes, which are not really, uh, they do not conform with what is existing. So how is that justified? Because I know they're going to say the first uh, plan that the second plan of 2006 had um, the other section at IC, whatever. But the thing is, right now there's nothing there, so they cannot put townhomes and justify it as it being what is in existence because there are no townhomes there. So, how does this developer justify the only townhomes when they are all single family homes there? Mr. Rivera? And then, and, then you get to, and then you get to close out, Mr. Rivera. Okay. Okay, and thank you for the, thank you for the question. The sector plan modified the former sector plan of 2006 to delete the active adult recommendations, which would have allowed mid-rise to high-rise apartments and make the rest of the site open space. It modified the land use recommendations for the entire property, including other adjoining properties, to require an RR light density. So that being said, the 272 units equal RR density, even though some of those are townhomes, it still does not exceed RR, which is exactly what is all around us. So from a density standpoint, it's in conformance with the second plan, which the council just approved in 2018, and which your staff extensively reviewed, and it's on page 15 of the report, of the uh, staff report, in terms of master plan conformance. So master plan performance does not mean unit type equals unit type in the area. It deals with land use. It does not deal with necessarily product unless it was that specific of the sector plan, say like a route one. So the density is commensurate with what's around us and no more and no less at that point. Um, Mr. Rivera, what's the percentage um, of townhomes? Is it a little, uh, is it a little less than 25%? 210 single 62 towns. I uh, can't do the math fast enough. But the townhouses are on the R18 C portion of the property, which would have allowed for high rise apartments at higher density. But we're restricting it to just uh, townhouses, but still at an RR density overall. Okay. For the Thank, whole site. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. That's 22.7%. Thank you. Um, um, 
So do you have anything else to add in summation? And everyone else needs to turn their mics off because we're getting some feedback. Okay. Again, Lauren Rivera for the record. Uh, we would ask for your uh, support for this project so we can move on to the next phases. I will continue to work with Maribel, Mr. Doherty, and everybody else in the area and as we have done and make sure we keep that dialogue going. And we appreciate the uh, uh, also the approval to provide conditions which staff can curve with. Thank you. Which we will mark as applicants exhibit number one. It's already in the record, but just for purposes of identification. Thank you. Um, Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm enter I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, um, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve preliminary plan 4 19005, TCP 1 016 2019, and variance to section 25 122 B1G for 179 specimen trees along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further revised by applicant exhibit number one. We have a motion. Is there Bailey. a second? Bailey and second. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington and a second by Vice Chair Bailey. Under discussion, does the board have any discussion? Um, hearing none other than what has already been expressed, um, I would um, uh, Ask for um, in, indicate by saying aye or nay, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Nay. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay. The motion carries five zero. While I have everyone, um, we have before us item 11, which is a um, resolution which needs to be amended in accordance with the amended um, um, recommendations um, in applicant's exhibit number one. Is it? We have a motion, I guess, by uh, Vice Chair Bailey and a seconded by um, Commissioner Washington. All in favor? Ms. Bailey? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Washington? Aye. Um, Mr. Dorner? Aye. Mr. G Geraldo? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you. A 5 0. Um, the board is going to take a break. It is now going to be um, 42 minutes, 43 minutes instead of 30 minutes, and we will resume promptly at 2 30. Thank you so very much, everyone. And at 2.30, we will continue um, with um, easy, 2.30, easy storage at Capitol Heights and the conceptual site plan for Agar, and detailed site plan for Agar Road. Thank you. Thank you.